Hey guys, Q here. In this video, I'll be breaking down every episode of Better Call Saul Season 3 and ranking them in a tier list. Took you long enough. Warning is spoilers for Better Call Saul Seasons 1, 2, and 3, and let's jump right into this. Season 3, Episode 1. Mabel. The Gene scene is the best one so far. We first get another great Cinnabon montage to the song Sugartown, and I love how well it works here. Gene goes on his break to eat his lunch on a bench upstairs. As he's eating his sandwich, he sees a thief hide in a photo booth. When cops approach Gene, he rats out the thief just to get the cops away from him. The cops catch the thief red-handed and thank Gene as they arrest the thief and take him away. Gene has a mini Saul Goodman outburst where he yells at the thief to not say anything. Nice job. Say nothing, you understand? Get a lawyer! Get a lawyer. Asshole. The cops call him a dick and leave. Then when Gene goes back to work, the adrenaline catches up to him, and he collapses at his work post, falling to the ground dramatically. I love that outburst that Gene has, showing that there's still some Saul Goodman inside of him, and that Gene is just so used to being in hiding that he can't handle it. Also quite a good cliffhanger that gets instantly answered in the next Gene scene, but more on that when I do the Season 4 tier list. Back in the main Better Call Saul timeline, we pick up right where Season 2 left off, but from the other side of the tinfoil curtain as Jimmy leaves. I love the way that Better Call Saul instantly gives payoff to their cliffhangers, a topic that I could do an entire video on. We see Jimmy calling Howard outside of Chuck's house to tell Howard that Chuck feels better and that he won't be retiring. Jimmy goes back inside and helps Chuck take down all the tinfoil. This is where Chuck shows Jimmy how to properly remove duct tape from the walls without leaving a mark. It sounds kind of dull saying out loud, but I really like it. Quite the Mr. Miyagi moment, which Jimmy even references himself. Left, right. I get it. Wax on, wax off. Mr. Miyagi. Karate Kid. It has a great significance due to Chuck loving to be the one that Jimmy needs help from. It's also messed up considering Jimmy is helping Chuck just after Chuck secretly stabbed Jimmy in the back. This duct tape moment also has a payoff later in the season. While taking down the tape, Jimmy finds an old book that he remembers from childhood. Jimmy misremembers that their mom read it to him, but Chuck corrects him as he read that book to Jimmy himself. The book is called The Adventures of Mabel, which the episode is titled after. They also discuss Jimmy's old nightlight. This has a big payoff at the end of the season. As as Jimmy keeps reminiscing, Chuck cuts him off, saying that he'll never forget what Jimmy just admitted to in regards to the Mesa Verde numbers, and the scene ends with Chuck telling Jimmy that he will pay. Jimmy, I liked her. She was Jimmy, always... don't think I'll ever forget what happened here today, and you will pay. Jimmy returns to his office to see Kim helping his elder clients for him, to the point that she's almost done with all of them. Here we get the iconic image of Jimmy rubbing Kim's shoulders in their new Season 3 office, as Jimmy tries telling Kim that he admitted what he did with Mesa Verde to Chuck. Kim doesn't want to hear it and cuts the shoulder massage short. As they sit at their desk, Jimmy says that for 10 minutes today, Chuck didn't hate him and that he forgot what that felt like. I love this moment and find it very powerful considering that all Jimmy has ever wanted was Chuck's love and respect, which Chuck can never give. Now back at Chuck's house, he shows Howard to Jimmy's secret confession tape. Howard says that he doesn't know where to begin, and that he means that in more ways than one. Howard thinks that both Chuck and Jimmy are ridiculous, as Howard is stuck in the middle of this brotherly vendetta. Howard agrees with Chuck and calls Jimmy a wild class SOAB. Howard continues to support Chuck only because he feels like he has to, even if he doesn't agree with Chuck constantly hunting after Jimmy. We also find out Chuck never told Howard about his plan to record Jimmy, so Howard genuinely genuinely thought that Chuck was retiring from HHM and very sick during the season 2 finale, which Howard obviously did not appreciate. Howard lists off a bunch of problems about the secret tape being useful in the court of law or public opinion and Chuck agrees. Howard then asks what the point is since he can't think of a single use for it, but Chuck says that he has an idea. As Jimmy helps Elder Kleins, he finds the Air Force captain in his waiting room who he conned last season during the episode Fifi. He gives Jimmy a piece of his mind, and to be honest, I was never really a fan of this scene. The scene is important towards the people that Jimmy screwed over eventually realizing and becoming pissed off at him, but I never really liked this Air Force Captain character. The Captain threatens to take him to court if he doesn't stop airing his commercial, and Jimmy pushes back with them having a back and forth resulting in the Captain leaving. Kim meets Paige in the Mesa Verde lobby, with Paige praising her for her amazing work being incredibly ahead of schedule. Paige tells her that she was the right choice for them, referencing Kim's original pitch in Season 2 while trying to get them to hire her instead of HHM. I am not the safe choice. I believe, however, that I am the right choice. 
I knew you were the right one for this. Paige starts talking smack about how Chuck told her that she was muddying the waters at the Mesa Verde Bank expansion hearing, along with saying that he couldn't even get the address right. Paige adds that when crunch time comes with guys like that, it's always someone else's fault. This rubs Kim the wrong way, as she knows that it actually is someone else's fault, Jimmy's. Paige thanks Kim for cleaning up the mess that McGill made, which is an unintentional double meaning as it was actually Jimmy. This scene may seem insignificant, but it does an amazing job at pulling on Kim's moral heartstrings and knowing that she only got this job because Jimmy screwed over Chuck, even if Kim is an amazing worker as well. The next scene shows Jimmy repainting their office walls as Kim struggles with punctuation on a single part of her work, which she told Paige that she wanted to double check. Kim struggles whether to add a semicolon, a double dash, or a period. She's clearly bothered by what Paige said. This is yet another great example of the show creators letting us know how a character feels by showing what they're looking at instead of just telling us. Ernie brings Chuck groceries and also buys him batteries. Chuck leads Ernie to change the batteries in his cassette form. Ernesto! Thought I could do this myself. Uh, would you mind uh, changing the batteries? Sure thing, Mr. McGill. But when he does, Jimmy's confession tape starts playing. Chuck rushes over to stop the tape, yelling at Ernie to turn it off and that he didn't hear anything. Turn that off! Turn it off! You did not hear that! Chuck spews some confidentiality BS, telling Ernie that he can't tell anyone about the tape. Since Ernie isn't allowed to tell anyone, that just makes him want to do that even more, which is exactly what Chuck secretly intended. Chuck sounds really convincing here, but Chuck planned this on purpose. Chuck left the tape in the recorder for Ernie to hear as he wants Ernie to tell Jimmy and Kim about it. Chuck can't directly tell Ernie to do so, so he takes advantage of Ernie's conscience instead. You must not, you cannot tell anyone there could be terrible consequences. This is horrible of Chuck to do, especially considering the outcome, which we'll get into in the next episode. Chuck continues to roll around in the mug with Jimmy, even if he can't admit it to himself, let alone anyone else. Meanwhile, we get an instant answer to the season 2 finale Mike Cliffhanger, jumping right back into the moment where he unjams his car horn and sees the don't note. Mike gets understandably spooked, so he speeds away as fast as he can. I love how the show instantly pays off cliffhangers, putting us right back in the moment with no delay or time skip. Mike pulls over while still in the desert and checks his car for a tracker but can't find one so he takes his vehicle to an auto parts junkyard to take the vehicle apart piece by piece to find a tracker. This moment has gotten a lot of complaints within the fandom so I guess it's an unpopular take to praise it but I really enjoyed it during my initial viewing and I still don't have a problem with it. Mike takes apart his entire car without finding a tracker so he gives up, asking the employee to call him a cab. Mike then notices new gas caps hanging up in the auto parts shop and gets the idea to check inside his gas cap for his vehicle. Sure enough, he finds a tracker. What's really cool about this is that he looked at the gas cap earlier in the montage, but discarded it without much thought. It was right under his nose the whole time. Mike goes home and takes apart the tracker in order to inspect it and buy the exact same tracker of his own. The following night, after Mike gets off work from the toll booth, he removes his gas cap so he can go off the grid from whoever is tracking him. Mike meets Caldera in an empty parking lot at 3.30 in the morning to buy his own tracker. Caldera Dara says that he'll charge Mike double due to it being an after hours call, which is $1,000 on top of how much the tracker costs. Caldera asks Mike about his dog, showing Caldera's true passion for being a vet. It'll take Caldera a few days to get the tracker, and he asks to do business during business hours from now on. Now by the end of the episode, Mike now has a tracker of his own, the exact same model as the one in his gas cap. Mike tests how removing the battery to his own tracker causes it to lose signal, and that it instantly regains signal as soon as he puts it back in. He then swaps his own tracker with the original one that his gas cap was bugged with. Mike grabs his hand radio and connects it to the battery in the tracker that his car was bugged with in a way that doesn't remove the battery so the people following him won't lose their signal. Mike leaves it like this all day so the battery in the tracker will quickly drain without raising suspicion. Once drained, Mike just throws it out and sits by his window all night long. This causes the people following him to come and replace the tracker in his gas cap unaware that it's actually Mike's. Now Mike is able to track the people originally tracking him quite the reverse card play. This episode ends with Mike going out to his car to follow the man tracking him while leaving his own gas cap behind so they won't know that he's following them. And yes, this also continues the streak of silent scenes with Mike, which to be honest I don't mind at all. I remember loving this scene when the episode first came out and it got me really excited for episode 302 to see what Mike discovers. Season 3 is also the first season of Better Call 
Saul that I started covering on my channel, which definitely added to the excitement of it all. Some silent scenes in Better Call Saul that mainly focus on cinematography of slow storytelling can seem a bit self-indulgent, but not with Mike in my opinion. I love seeing Mike put his old cop detective skills to work, such as in Season 1 when he stole the Kettleman's bag of money. Here's no different. I could watch an entire episode of Mike doing detective work without any dialogue and be completely fine with it. I'm giving this episode an A tier. This episode was very much a conclusion episode to the multiple cliffhangers given to us in Season 2, along with setting up future story arcs for the rest of Season 3. I was originally going to give this episode a strong B instead of an A, but the Season 3 Gene scene along with Mike's story with the tracker just barely tips the scale for me. Season 3 Episode 2 Witness. This episode starts with Chuck in his house with a PI. Chuck keeps looking out his windows, waiting, with the PI there due to being the witness that Chuck needs. I love the foreshadowing that the cold open has for the end of the episode. Meanwhile, Mike is watching over the men who have been tracking him, with them having a conversation about switching the tracker due to the low battery. They say they did it with no problem and that nobody saw them, implying that they aren't onto Mike at all. Mike continues following one of the men to various dead drop locations, including a specific culvert that will become important in Season 5, Wink Wink. Wink. Insert praise for watching Mike doing detective work without any dialogue here. Mike's trail ends with watching the man walk into a fast food joint with the bag of money that he collected from all the dead drops, with the camera zooming out to reveal that it's Los Pollos Hermanos! Although some of us already knew that Gus was going to return due to the Frings Back Easter Egg in the Season 2 episode titles, this is still a great reveal, and I absolutely love it. I also love the Dead End Road sign as Mike drives away, implying his dead end in tracking Gus's man. We then get the first introduction to Francesca and Better Call Saul, along with the Better Call Saul Breaking Bad universe timeline in general. What a great Breaking Bad cameo that will continue throughout the entire season. Francesca walks in on Jimmy repainting the office wall, which really does totally look like a stock market crash. Francesca gets interviewed by Jimmy and Kim to be their secretary. She says she used to work at the DMV, or the MVD rather. I mean, why leave the DMV, or MVD? This interview goes so well that Jimmy abruptly asks Francesca if she can start that day. Kim rushes Francesca out, freaking out at Jimmy for being so spread. Hey, here's a question. Can you start today? I can. Uh, yes. Fantastic. No. Can you can you just give us a second, Francesca? Absolutely. I. Jimmy convinces Kim to hire Francesca, saying that she's overqualified and that he needs a receptionist now due to having a commercial that's about to air. She's more than adequate. She worked at the DMV. That's like the fifth circle of hell. We then cut straight to Jimmy coaching Francesca on how to answer phone calls for him. Absolutely love this scene. Folks, be folks. Say, is that a dog I'm hearing? with Jimmy telling her to be folksy, even calling him by his first name to clients, and telling her to mention Cracker Barrel. Yeah, Cracker Barrel. Always helps to mention Cracker Barrel. I was thinking of going over to Cracker Barrel because they've got such great air conditioning. We get an immediate Cracker Barrel payoff with Mike calling Francesca to speak to Jimmy. Considering that Mike is in the middle of buying a new used car, that's an oxymoron if I ever heard of one, but you get what I mean. I, I hear Cracker Barrel has excellent air- This one really don't want to talk about Cracker Barrel. So I guess that the timing is coincidental and that Mike didn't see Jimmy's commercial. I love Francesca saying Mr. Ermin Trout, signifying who she's talking to along with her response to his last name. If you'd like to leave a message, Mr. Ermin Trout? Trout like the fish? Jimmy rushes over to tell her that he'll take the call, hilariously starting the conversation with Mike by talking about Francesca. Your new assistant's a real pip. Yeah, thanks for crushing her spirit on the first day. Mike asks if Jimmy's the only person on the line and asks to meet up for breakfast the next day. We then immediately cut to Jimmy driving into the Los Poyos parking lot with Mike giving voiceover for their plan from their breakfast before this happens. Mike giving voiceover is a great way to explain the situation while being able to just cut to the chase and jump straight into Jimmy going to Los Poyos. Jimmy is tasked with buying a meal, sitting at a booth, and watching for the man with a bag that Mike was tracking earlier in the episode. During the voiceover, Jimmy correctly guesses that it's money or drugs in the bag, but Mike purposely keeps him out of the loop, which becomes a reoccurring theme in the series. Is it money? It's gotta be money. Drugs? Is it drugs? Something else? Well, uh, I'm guessing money. Tell me I'm right. He is gonna be here any minute. Jimmy does what he's told, but acting nonchalant is not his forte. He sees the green Chevy Blazer pull into the parking lot, just like Mike said, and stares down the man with the bag. Jimmy gets close to him by dumping multiple sugar packets in his drink while the man orders his food, hitting one of the drink dispensers by accident. Jimmy then moves his tray from his booth 
to sit at a nearby table closer to the man, and he also has not touched his food at all. I love how Jimmy takes a sip of his drink, showing a disgusted look on his face, instantly regretting all the packets that he dumped into it. As Jimmy keeps staring the man down, we get our first glance at Gus in the background and out of focus. Gus can clearly see Jimmy staring down his dead drop collector, causing Gus to not allow the interaction to happen between himself and this man. I love how Gus even walks past Jimmy, blocking his line of sight to the man that he's watching. The guy that Jimmy's staring down picks up his bag and leaves without delivering the cash like he probably usually does. Jimmy is so desperate to collect intel from Mike that he starts searching through the garbage that he saw the dead drop guy throw trash into. Jimmy then gets confronted by Gus, causing Jimmy to purposely drop his watch into the trash as an excuse. I love the Gus reveal in this show, and how it mirrors Breaking Bad, with Gus just being some background employee until it's revealed who he truly is. Can I help you? Uh, my watch. Uh... But it's not just the same thing over again. Better Call Saul does it slightly differently with hiding Gus's face until he confronts Jimmy at the garbage due to assuming that the audience already knows who Gus is from already seeing Breaking Bad. Gus volunteers to help Jimmy retrieve his watch and sends Jimmy on his way. Gus was definitely 100% onto Jimmy and confronted him because of it. Absolutely love how this is the only time that Jimmy ever meets Gus face to face without realizing that he's the infamous Gus Fring that he'll come to learn about during Breaking Bad. There's so many layers to this confrontation in the show creators did a perfect job introducing Gus into Better Call Saul. So Jimmy returns to Mike with the voiceover beginning as Gus is still putting away the garbage. Mike's dialogue begins with, tell me again, to which I visibly flinched during my rewatch of this episode due to the trauma from a certain scene in season 5, and if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Tell me again. Jesus, how many different ways you want me to say it? Jimmy tells Mike that the guy that he was watching ordered food, ate it within 5 minutes, didn't look at anyone, and no one touched his bag, and then he left with it. I assume that Mike is able to realize that Jimmy probably spooked him due to Jimmy being able to specifically recite every single thing that the bag man did. Jimmy got too close and he blew Mike's cover. I love how Jimmy is just so eager to continue following the bag man, telling Mike that he has some real James Bond gadgets looking at the tracker. You got some real James Bond stuff in here. This car doesn't have an ejector seat, does it? There's so many amazing pieces of dialogue in this episode that I wish I could just show every single clip, but sadly, Sony's copyright trigger finger would most likely disagree with me doing so. So Mike unenthusiastically tells Jimmy that he doesn't need him anymore, with Jimmy reluctant not wanting to leave. Jimmy says that he cleared his morning, wanting to tail the bagman to a new location, but Mike just reaches over and opens his door for him, saying thank you for your time. I also love how before Jimmy leaves, he tells Mike that he has his back in the best way possible. Hey, who's got your back? Huh? Me, that's who. I'll keep that in mind. It gives some real younger brother vibes being excited to hang out with a reluctant older brother. The Jimmy and Mike storylines don't cross paths much in the earlier seasons or even in the show in general, but when they do, it's absolutely amazing. So as Jimmy leaves Mike and drives away, Gus is shown standing in the parking lot watching them, obviously aware that Jimmy was indeed involved with Mike, who Gus has been tracking ever since Mike tried to kill Hector in the season 2 finale. This is confirmation that Jimmy blew Mike's cover, along with showing that Gus is onto the fact that Mike is onto him being onto Mike in the first place. Wow, what a back and forth cycle. Mike continues to stake out Los Poyos, even with his cover possibly blown, and starts following a black SUV driven by Victor, due to it being the vehicle that Mike's tracker is in. This is also Victor's first appearance in Better Call Saul. I feel like Gus purposely is sending Victor out with the tracker, knowing that Mike is going to follow him. So as Mike follows his tracker, he notices that the tracker eventually stops moving. Mike inches up to it, gets out of his car, and notices it in the middle of the road with a phone ringing on top. Mike answers it, which is the Mike cliffhanger that we're left on for the episode. Meanwhile, Ernie arrives at Jimmy and Kim's office, and calls Kim to go out into the parking lot to meet with her. Ernie tells Kim that he doesn't want to go inside and see Jimmy, and that he already screwed up by calling her. Ernie tells Kim that he doesn't want to get in trouble, but says that Chuck has a tape recording of Jimmy confessing to a crime. Kim goes in to tell Jimmy what Ernie told her, while Francesca continues talking about Cracker Barrel to one of the elder clients in the background. Uh, just be a second, folks. Gosh, have you guys had a soup over at Cracker Kim asks Jimmy for a dollar, making him her client, giving them confidentiality. This is a reference to Saul's first episode in Breaking Bad when Walt and Jesse kidnapped him. Hello, I can't. Give me a dollar. Give you a dollar. Yeah, just hand me a dollar. Okay. Come on. First things first, you're gonna put a dollar in my pocket, both of you. All I got's a 20. Fine, whatever. All right, now you ski bum. Come on. Give with the dollar. All I got's a five. I'll take a five. Come on already. Come on. Saul did this with them out in the desert, and here we can see the origins of where he got that move from. You want attorney-client privilege, don't you? 
so that everything you say is strictly between us. I'm your lawyer now. If anyone asks me what I know, we have confidentiality. Why do we need confidentiality? Jimmy, what did you say to Chuck? Okay, you're now both officially represented by Saul Goodman and Associates. Your secrets are safe with me under threat of disbarment. So Kim asked Jimmy what he said to Chuck, and Jimmy explains first by saying that his house looked like the inside of a Jiffy Pop wrapper with Mylar all over the walls. Jimmy explains how he confessed, switching the numbers due to Chuck acting like he was sick, broken, and ready to retire over the Mesa Verity discrepancy. Kim tells Jimmy that there's a tape of his confession, and that Ernie told her. Of course, Kim didn't want to talk about this situation in the first episode of season 3, but now that Ernie has forced her hand, she has to talk about it. After learning that Chuck Jimmy, Jimmy leans on a shelf with shock and awe, just letting it all sink in. Kim says that they'll figure it out, but Jimmy's just speechless at going back to his clients. Later that day, after the elder clients are gone, Kim updates Jimmy saying that Chuck had the right to make the recording, but that Jimmy should just go with the excuse that he said what he did to just make Chuck feel better, being concerned about his health. While Kim tells Jimmy their options, Jimmy just silently rolls the tape off his newly painted wall in the same method that Chuck taught him in the last episode. Kim asks Jimmy if he's okay, to which he says yes, but we all know that's a lie. Jimmy is usually so talkative, so his silence here speaks volumes. After Kim leaves, Jimmy stops carefully rolling back the tape and rips it off the walls, storming out. And I love the symbolism there. Jimmy, quit yanking at it. Gently roll it with your thumbs. Meanwhile, Howard parks a block away from Chuck's house, hilariously jumping through backyards to get to his house so he won't be seen going there. Howard says that Chuck is at a PI for 8 days, giving us an idea on the current timeline and that it's been just over a week since the beginning of Season 3. Howard says that the 24-7 PI bills are adding up, but Chuck contends that they have an obligation as officers of the court to not let Jimmy get away with what he did. Chuck does eventually compromise, wanting to limit the PI to night hours only, as Jimmy will most likely break in while Chuck is sleeping. Howard asks Chuck if he really thinks that Jimmy will break in to steal the tapes, to which Chuck says yes and that he knows his brother. This proves that Chuck let Ernie find out on purpose, manipulating him knowing that he would go and tell Jimmy and Kim about the tape. What's hilarious is that Chuck was instantly proven right but wrong at the same time. He's right that Jimmy will break into his house to steal the tape, but wrong that Jimmy will have the forward thinking to try and sneak in at night. It just makes the most sense he'll try to steal the tape under cover of darkness. I know my brother. Chuck and Howard get interrupted, with Jimmy banging on the door in broad daylight, demanding to be let in. In a fit of rage, Jimmy kicks the door in, screaming at Chuck for taping him. Jimmy rightfully accuses Chuck for conning him, pretending he was sick just to secretly record Jimmy's confession. The only thing Jimmy has ever cared about was his brother, and Chuck knew this and abused it. As Jimmy searches for the tape, he continuously calls Chuck an asshole, along with saying hateful things such as, no wonder Rebecca left you. Ouch. Jimmy pries open a locked drawer in Chuck's desk. The PI wants to rush in and stop him, but Howard stops the PI, causing them to stay hidden from around the corner. Jimmy destroys the tape in front of Chuck, yelling that he destroyed their family for nothing. For this, you destroyed our family? You have me now for what? For nothing! <laughs> Jimmy continues to yell, saying that Chuck better tell him if he made copies or he'll burn the house to the ground. And wow, foreshadowing much? As Jimmy says this, Howard and the PI rush into the room, telling him to stop. Chuck confirms that both Howard and the PI are a witness to what just happened. Jimmy and Chuck stare at each other in total silence, and the episode ends. If it's any hint considering how much time I spent on this episode, I'm giving it an S tier. In my opinion, aside from maybe Mike's 5-0 backstory in Season 1, this is the best episode of Better Call Saul so far. I can confidently say that episode 302 is criminally underrated, being better than the entirety of season 2 and most of season 1. This episode is just so amazing, and I love so many different moments, from the Francesca cameo, to the Gus introduction while seeing Jimmy and Mike work together, to the explosive ending. I've always liked this episode, but forgot just how much. In my opinion, season 3 is when the show really starts getting good, with this episode being a turning point. Season 3, episode 3. Some costs. This episode technically begins with our first ever Breaking Bad flash forward. We see some old red shoes hanging on a power line near the border, with a Los Pollos truck driving right under it. Normally, shoes hanging on a power line represents that someone died there, potentially a murder involving gang activity. We'll get into the reason why these shoes are hanging there later in the episode. In the current timeline, Mike answers the phone in the middle of the road, continuing the cliffhanger from the last episode. We hear Gus's voice as they come to an agreement to keep their guns holstered and for Mike to expect two cars momentarily. 
barely. Gus arrives, and they have their first ever face-to-face -face confrontation. Mike holds up the don't note, and they discuss Hector. Gus says that he's an associate of an associate, and that it's not in his interest for Hector to die at this time. Gus explains that he's aware of Mike's interactions with Hector from season 2, even the truck heist. Gus confronts Mike on not leaving Hector alone, even after taking his money and his family no longer being in danger. Gus knows that Mike wants justice for Hector killing the innocent civilian that found the truck driver, and tells Mike that he'd be okay with Mike continuing to hinder Hector's business. Mike realizes that Gus and Hector are competitors, and so they strike up a deal for Mike to continue hurting Hector's business. We get a cameo of Gus's Mexican doctor that saved both Gus and Mike during Breaking Bad. Mike meets the doctor to retrieve a package of drugs, and then puts the drugs into the now brand new pair of red sneakers, followed by throwing it up onto the telephone wire from the beginning of the episode. Mike waits nearby with his binoculars and sniper for one of Hector's delivery trucks to drive by, and stops to stash their guns in the spot that we saw from Season 2. Mike starts shooting his sniper in the air, causing the drivers to panic, but then quickly assume that the gunshots are just due to hunters. The men get back in their truck, and Mike aims for the red shoes and shoots them, which begins sparkling drugs onto the truck as it drives below. This causes the truck to get sniffed out and busted at the border. Meanwhile, Jimmy calls Francesca to reschedule his appointments for the next day, and he has a smoke outside Chuck's waiting for the cops to arrive. Here's what's going to happen. The police will arrest you, and I'm sorry, but I will be pressing charges. I told you there would be consequences, but I have to believe you'll face those consequences, and you'll come out the other side a better man. Here we get the brutal back and forth between Chuck and Jimmy, where Chuck tries claiming that he's doing this to teach Jimmy a lesson, while Jimmy just says that Chuck will die alone. Here's what's gonna happen. One day you're gonna get sick again. One of your employees is gonna find you, take you to the hospital, and this time it'll be too much, and you will die there alone. Jimmy gets arrested and taken down to the station at the courthouse to get put into the system. Bill Oakley visits Jimmy to give him a hard time, and Jimmy says he'll be representing himself. Jimmy spends the night in jail, and in the morning we get a montage of Kim getting ready for the day, showing that she slept in her office and goes across the street to the fitness center to shower and clean up. Notice the earrings that she wears, and keep that in mind for three seasons from now. When Kim walks back to her office, Ernie's there waiting for her, telling her that Chuck fired him and updates her on Jimmy's situation. Jimmy begins to represent himself but Kim rushes in to try and save the day. Jimmy refuses to allow her to represent him, and then he gets released on a $2,500 bond. Jimmy meets Kim back at the office and explains how Chuck conned him again, realizing that Chuck purposely told Ernie about the tape because Chuck knew that Ernie would tell Jimmy, causing Jimmy to barge into his house and try and grab the tape. Chuck bamboozled me again. Chuck played me like a fiddle, and schmuck that I am, I fell for it. Jimmy wants to take care of Chuck's vendetta himself, and Kim coldly agrees. Jimmy asks Francesca to drive him to his car, telling her that this isn't a typical week. We then see Oakley double fisting two bags of chips from his favorite vending machine, and Jimmy sits beside him to try to get him to prosecute his own case. Oakley informs him that since everyone at the Albuquerque office knows him, they're bringing in someone called Miss Hay from Berlin, a town nearby. Miss Hay meets Chuck at his house to go over details. Chuck implies that he doesn't want to charge Jimmy, but he wants a better solution. The final scene of the episode involves the iconic sunk cost conversation between Jimmy and Kim, which the episode is named after. Even as seasons passed, I come back to this scene as a tragically poetic explanation for Kim supporting Jimmy. Jimmy explains that he got a PPD deal offer from Miss Hay, but she wants Jimmy to admit everything. I love how Kim tells him to keep Victor with a K on a lockdown for a year, and he responds by saying that's not a problem, calling her Giselle. You gonna be able to keep your nose clean for a whole year? Keep Victor with a K on lockdown? It's not a problem, Giselle. Jimmy reveals that the PPD was Chuck's idea, and that he wants to get Jimmy disbarred. Kim says that she'll help Jimmy fight this, and Jimmy sincerely asks why. Why would you... Come on. This guy? Seriously? Kim calls it the fallacy of sunk cost, which is a less than flattering explanation. Sunk cost is essentially when you've put so much time and effort into something that you continue doing so, even though it's not worth it. Let's just call it the fallacy of sunk costs. So what now? Now, now we uh, take that PPD and we shove it right up Chuck's ass. The episode ends with Jimmy saying that they should take the PPD and shove it up Chuck's ass, finally accepting Kim's help after trying to deny it earlier in the episode. Also, I absolutely love the cinematography of this scene, with Jimmy and Kim standing in front of the giant square stained glass windows. It's probably one of my favorite cinematic moments of the entire show. This episode gets a strong A tier. I love Mike and Gus's first face-to-face -face combo, along with Jimmy brutally telling Chuck that he'll die alone. The episode starts and ends strong with the final 
convo with Kim and Jimmy in regards to sunk costs, and I also love the multiple Bill Oakley appearances too. The only thing that holds this episode down from an S tier is some slow parts in the middle, and although I love the mystery of the red shoes coming to fruition with Mike, it's just the beginning of his work for Gus. Season 3 Episode 4 Tabrosito. The episode starts with our first ever Better Call Saul visit to Don Eladio's in Mexico, with Hector and Bolsa visiting him in a flashback. Eladio jumping into his pool is a great reference to his fate in Breaking Bad. Hector introduces one of his drivers to Eladio, who gives him a hard time. Hector informs Eladio of a new business he just purchased, an ice cream store called The Winking Greek. Not only that, but Hector says he named the store after Eladio, even showing Eladio a bobblehead of him. Hector then dumps out money on the table, all rolled up with elastic bands. Bolsa joins in greets Eladio, giving him a Los Pollos t-shirt. Pollos hermanos, que bien bolsa, mira Hector, Pollos hermanos. Yo diría los culos hermanos. <laughs> Hector insults Los Pollos, calling them the Butt Brothers, referencing how Hector made fun of Gus and his former associate Max for possibly having a homosexual relationship during the Breaking Bad flashback. Bolsa delivers more than triple the money at Hector, saying that Gustavo sends his regards. Eladio mocks Hector for Gus providing so much more money, along with it being neatly stacked instead of rolled up in elastic bands. Eladio continuously calls the little bobblehead version of him Sabrosito, which the episode is named after. After the intro theme, we see Mike in the current timeline back in his favorite stakeout spot, over watching Hector's ice cream business being busted. He calls Stacy, updating him on her life in her new house with Kaylee. Stacy invites Mike over for dinner and he reluctantly agrees. The next day, Hector barges into Los Pollos, threatening and accosting the customers and employees by lighting up a cigar inside, along with going behind the counter to grab himself a drink. This is also the first appearance of Lyle, the amazing Los Pollos assistant manager. Hector demands that Lyle brings him Fring, and I really feel for Lyle here. As the customers start to leave, Arturo stops them, but Nacho shakes his head, telling Arturo to let them leave. Hector then goes to wait in Gus's back office. Gus gets interrupted speaking with the local firemen, showing Gus his infamous facade of being involved with the local community as we know him for in Breaking Bad. When Gus arrives at Los Pollos, all the customers are gone, with just the employees sitting in a circle with Nacho and Arturo. Gus sends his employees home, compensating them for the rest of the day. Lyle double checks to make sure that Gus will be alright alone, and Gus assures Lyle that he doesn't need to call anybody. Mark Margolis does an amazing job acting like a total disrespectful dick as Hector, and I love this confrontation between Hector and Gus. I am the cartel, and from now on, you are my mule. You are going to bring my product north. Gus sympathizes with Hector for his business being busted, but Gus says that his trucks are full. Hector starts flicking poop off of his shoe onto Gus's desk, and Gus says that he answers to Bolsa and Eladio, to which Hector tells him to go cry to them if he wants. Gus asks if Eladio approves this, to which Hector says that he approves it, and tells Gus that he's gonna do this whether he likes it or not. Moments like this make me really side with Gus, even knowing the monster that he himself becomes, and already is to some extent. As Gus cleans up the Los Pollos alone, he smiles while throwing some garbage into the trash, implying that he's happy that Hector is pissed off and stressed, because as we know, Hector's business got busted because of Mike getting one of his trucks busted at the border. Gus also plans to do such a good job smuggling Hector's drugs that it'll later backfire on Hector in future episodes. Now Victor visits Mike at his toll booth during the night shift, delivering payment for disrupting Hector's supply. Mike throws the money back into Victor's SUV, telling Victor that they're square. Clearly Mike doesn't want to be held under Gus's thumb for accepting his payment. The next morning, morning, Gus arrives at Los Poyos and gives his employees a very motivational cover story speech. Gus explains that he'll provide free counseling for mental trauma, along with the employees all receiving 24 hours worth of extra overtime pay. Lyle asks who those men were, and Gus explains that they accosted him for money back when Gus originally opened Los Poyos in Mexico, and that he paid them there in order to continue having his restaurant open. Gus says that they came asking for money again, but he grew a backbone, saying that this is America. The righteous have no reason to fear. Here, those men have no power, and when they saw that I had no fear of them, they ran, like the cowards they are, back across the border. Gus clearly wins over his workers with this speech, with them giving him a round of applause. I promise you that together we will prosper. All right. <laughs>
Now normally I like to split the cartel side and the lawyer side during my recaps, but this episode already did most of that for me. Everything up to this point has been purely cartel, with us finally jumping into the lawyer side of the show halfway through the episode. Kim calls every repair business in town until she can find the correct business that has made an appointment with Chuck to fix his door. Kim cancels the appointment so that Jimmy can hire Mike to do it instead. Kim then helps Jimmy with his admission letter, telling Jimmy to change a destroyed property to damaged property. The next day, we get the first and only time that Mike ever meets Chuck face to face. I love this interaction between the two of them, as I never thought that they'd meet. I wish that they had more scenes together, but just like Chuck and Kim from season 2, I understand why they don't. Now Mike asks where he can plug in his tools, to which Chuck protests, becoming agitated as he explained to the real business to have no power tools. No electricity due to a condition that was explained in some detail. Mike brings out some handheld power tools, saying that if he goes at it with just a hammer, it turns a quick job into multiple days. Chuck reluctantly agrees, keeping his distance. Good thing I charged my battery. I'd be going at it like Fred Flintstone otherwise. I understood there would be no power tools of any kind. What, a screwdriver and a hammer? Turns a morning job into two days with me, myself, and Ben Gay. It's your call. Mike purposely uses his power tools to keep Chuck at bay, causing Chuck to go upstairs instead of checking on him. Mike begins taking photos of Chuck's place with a disposable camera, which just screams nostalgia to me as I haven't seen one of those in like a decade and a half, very 2000s. Jimmy meets Mike at his favorite diner to show him the processed photos that he took, along with a note that Mike found on Chuck's desk. Jimmy asks Mike what he thought of Chuck, starting to talk smack about him. I kinda wish Mike shared his opinion here, but it's very Mike to stay silent. Mike says that it's nice to fix something for once, and as Jimmy leaves, he says that he's up for working together in the future if Mike ever needs anything. Later that night, Gus shows up at Mike's toll booth himself to speak. Gus confronts Mike on returning his payment, and Mike says that he didn't sabotage Hector for Gus. Gus says that he benefited more than Mike could ever know, and offers Mike to work for him in the future. Mike says it depends on the work, and right before Gus leaves, he says a bullet to the head would have been far too humane, implying his vendetta against Hector. I love that line, and I'm so happy that Giancarlo reprised his role as Gus not only for a cameo, but as a main character in Better Call Saul from here on out. The final few scenes of the episode involve a finalization meeting between between Jimmy, Kim, Howard, Chuck, and the ADA on the case. Miss Hay arrives and she notices that the lights are out for Chuck. She explains that Jimmy has to report to his PPD officer once a month, staying employed legally and only interacting with law-abiding citizens. Jimmy's confession will be referred to the bar, and Chuck calls out a discrepancy in the confession letter. Chuck calls out the damaged property line that Kim changed for Jimmy, stating that the cassette and the tape were destroyed. Kim tries to refute this, but Howard and Chuck fight back, saying, destroyed item of personal property, which sounds even worse than before Kim tried making it sound better. This just goes to show once again how petty Chuck is. This was very Chuck to do so. The ADA senses an apparent lack of remorse and forces Jimmy to apologize to Chuck on the spot. This feels like a grown-up equivalent of a teacher or parent telling a child to tell another child that they're sorry. Jimmy sincerely apologizes, saying no one should treat their own brother like that. This is a double-edged sword, however, due to the fact that the same could be said about how Chuck has treated Jimmy the entire show. Jimmy pays for the damaged door, but Howard and Chuck interrupt again, adding on the price of the cassette tape, which Chuck once again states was destroyed. Wow, pour salt into the wound, Chuck. Now after the meeting, Jimmy instantly walks away, but Kim confronts Chuck and Howard about making a duplicate tape. Howard tries denying it, but Chuck admits it, saying that it'll be put into evidence and that the tape will be played in court. Chuck and Howard walk away, thinking that they've had the last laugh, but as Kim meets up with Jimmy, she smiles as they have told her exactly what she wanted. The episode ends with them walking out the doors to Kim saying, Bingo. This episode gets an S tier. When this episode first aired, I thought the flashback was so freaking cool to Donald Audios that I would have given the entire episode an S tier solely on that. However, going into the episode this time, I wanted to see if the rest of the episode holds up to S tier standards, and it does. I love the Donald Audio flashback, along with Hector going to Los Poyos, followed by Gus confronting him. Gus's speech to his employees were great, and I really loved the Chuck and Mike scene, followed by Jimmy and Mike discussing it afterwards. Finally, the meeting between Howard, Chuck, Jimmy, and Kim could seem initially underwhelming, but it is really cool to see them all in the same room together as opposing forces. The episode also ends on a great cliffhanger to go into the next episode. Season 3, Episode 5. Chicanery? 
This episode starts with a flashback of Chuck and Jimmy preparing for Rebecca to visit. This flashback parallels the Season 2 Rebecca flashback of Jimmy and Chuck having dinner with her. Season 2 was while Rebecca and Chuck were still together, and right before slash right when Chuck's condition started. This flashback is after Rebecca and Chuck have divorced, and after Chuck has started experiencing his electronic allergy. Chuck's house is being repurposed for Chuck to live in without electricity, although Chuck is trying to hide his condition from Rebecca. Jimmy tells Chuck that he should just tell Rebecca the truth, as Chuck is going out of his way to light candles and to cook their own dinner to keep up with the ruse that he's fine. Later on, Jimmy walks in with Rebecca, pretending not to know why all the lights are out, and Chuck gives an elaborate excuse to Rebecca about the electricity bill. Dinner goes fine until Rebecca's phone starts ringing. The small amount of electricity caused by the phone visibly affects Chuck, trying to restrain himself while Jimmy shows concern. Rebecca walks closer and closer to Chuck, giving him large symptoms. The score during this scene is amazing, tensing up with electric static every time Rebecca comes near Chuck with the phone and easing off when she walks away. I love this little touch. Got it, got it. I will make sure that. Um, can, can, can you hold on a second? Let me just get a pen. Mm hmm. Chuck walks into the kitchen due to the phone making him so sick, but Rebecca follows them in there. Chuck can't take it anymore, and he hits Rebecca's phone out of her hand. Rebecca asks what Chuck's problem is, but he is unable to tell the truth about his condition. <laughs> Chuck should have just come clean like Jimmy suggested in the first place, and here he's given a second chance and still hides his condition. Chuck gives the excuse that it's incredibly inconsiderate to answer a phone call during dinner, making him seem even more rude and unhinged than he already is. What is your problem? It is incredibly bad manners to answer a cell phone in company. If Chuck would have been honest about his condition, Rebecca would have been surprised, but probably sympathetic. Now as she leaves, Jimmy tells Chuck to tell her the truth. Jimmy says he'll tell her himself, but Chuck demands that Jimmy doesn't, which is actually foreshadowing for later in the episode, wink wink. Now in the current timeline, Jimmy is at Caldera's with his goldfish. Caldera implies that Mike referred Jimmy to Caldera due to Jimmy wanting a pro with a light touch. Caldera asks if Jimmy needs this pro to fit in a tight spot, implying that the person in mind is on the large side. Meanwhile, Kim informs Paige and Kevin about Chuck's allegations against Jimmy. Kevin says that he's not going to let Chuck's drama ruin having the best outside cancel that he's ever had, so Kim's job is safe. Now Chuck and Howard get introduced to the courtroom that they'll be facing off against Jimmy in. As they walk in, they see the red exit sign glowing while hearing it buzz with electricity. Howard seems unsure of the situation, and he asks to speak to Chuck alone. He asks Chuck how he's feeling, and suggests that Chuck doesn't need to testify. Yet again, Howard implies that Chuck should back down, or at least not be there in person, but Chuck doubles down saying he needs to testify. Howard is worried about PR, but Chuck says that now's not the time to worry about how they look. Chuck says that this is about what's right and what's wrong. Chuck believes that Jimmy deserves his barman, not just a slap on the wrist. Howard is absolutely right in this situation, and Chuck is wrong. Chuck never wanted Jimmy to be a lawyer, and he's letting his vendetta against Jimmy get in the way. Even Howard notices this and is trying to stop it, but is too polite to, and so he can't. Now we hear the opening statement of the charges against Jimmy while we see Jimmy and Kim get ready and arrive themselves. Kim then gives her opening statement, introducing herself as Jimmy's defense, stating that Jimmy deeply regrets his actions. Kim brings up Jimmy's brotherly relationship with Chuck, and that once they have the full picture, they'll understand and agree that Jimmy should continue to practice law. Howard goes on trial as a witness, explaining how Jimmy broke into Chuck's house, broke open a locked drawer in Chuck's desk, and took the cassette tape and broke it. Kim begins her cross-examination, and asks Howard to elaborate on his past with Jimmy, including how long he's known him and what he thought of him. Howard says that Jimmy was a hard worker, he had a lot in him, and mentions his nickname for Jimmy being Charlie Hustle. I thought he had a lot of get up and go. He was a hard worker. Charlie Hustle. He'd put himself through law school, taken the bar exam without telling any of the partners, even Charles. Charlie Hustle is a slanderous nickname given to a baseball player in real life, who later owned the nickname as a positive instead of a negative. Although Charlie Hustle sounds great on paper, it does have some negative connotations to it. It's possible that Howard called Jimmy this in a positive way though, and not in the mocking way that it's originally from. Now due to Kim's continuous leading questions, Howard says that he was surprised Jimmy became a lawyer, and that they considered hiring Jimmy at HHM, but didn't due to nepotism. The partners decided it would be best to avoid the appearance of nepotism. We felt hiring Jimmy 
Jimmy might damage morale. This means that they didn't want it to seem like they were favoring friends and family, which is incredibly hypocritical coming from Howard, considering he was hired specifically due to this. Howard's dad wanted Howard to work at HHM to throw another H in the logo, turning Hamlin and McGill into the HHM that we now know. Who's used to say that they couldn't have added another M to the logo as well. Now what's funny is I paused the episode to type out those last few paragraphs, and then resumed the episode to find Kim accusing Howard of the exact nepotism hypocrisy I just mentioned. Your firm is Hamlin, Hamlin, and McGill, right? Who's the other Hamlin? My father. Which partner was the most concerned with nepotism? Charles McGill. So Jimmy's own brother blocked him. Kim's next leading question gets Howard to admit that it was Chuck who was concerned about nepotism, to which Kim suggests that Jimmy's own brother blocked him. Howard says that Jimmy didn't originally know it was Chuck who blocked him, and tries changing the subject to Jimmy's job at Davison, Maine, which Howard helped him get. Howard agrees that Jimmy took care of Chuck once he developed the condition, but Kim gets objected when she brings up Chuck's mental health. I love how Kim tries painting the picture of Chuck's resentment against Jimmy, regardless of how much Jimmy cared for him and still tried to help him. Jimmy hushes Francesca over asking what she's still doing there, and Francesca says that the flight was delayed. This adds mystery to Jimmy's true plans, which will be revealed in just a moment. The tape of Jimmy's confession gets played, but Jimmy and Kim ask for a moment to review in order to stall so their plan can come to fruition. Meanwhile, Chuck is at home rehearsing what he'll say. Chuck has to rehearse complimenting Jimmy over and over in order for it to sound genuine. Out of all the things that Chuck could be rehearsing, if this is what he chooses, clearly Chuck hates Jimmy so much that he has to prepare pretending to love him. As Howard picks up Chuck, the tape is played. It's difficult for everyone in the room to hear. Hearing the tape replayed in court is in some ways even more powerful than when it originally happened in the season 2 finale. I love that hearing something again that we the audience already saw but in a different situation changes and elaborates the meaning and importance of it. Chuck conned the confession out of Jimmy, manipulating how much Jimmy cares for him just to screw Jimmy over. Plus, Jimmy says that he switched the numbers for Kim, who is obviously defending Jimmy in this case. I also feel secondhand embarrassment for Jimmy in this moment that the tape is being played. They then prepare the room for Chuck's arrival, confiscating phones and anything else electronic, along with turning off the lights. Jimmy says that he left his phone in the car, which again is part of his mysterious plan, which is about to be revealed. As Chuck walks up the stairs into the courtroom, Huel bumps into him, turning around and giving Chuck a smirk as he walks away. This is the first appearance of Huel in Better Call Saul, and if you know what his talents are from Breaking Bad, you have a pretty good idea of what just happened. Now Chuck arrives in the courtroom as a witness to testify against Jimmy, and he introduces himself. Chuck is asked why he made the tape, and he says that he suspected Jimmy of tampering with Mesa Verde files. Chuck elaborates that Jimmy hoped the tainted documents would cause Mesa Verde to fire HHM and go back to Kim, which is exactly what happened. After Kim objects, Chuck clarifies that Kim had no idea that Jimmy did this, but that it happened. Chuck admits that he didn't have any evidence of Jimmy tampering with the files, and that he covered his tracks well. Kim objects, but they continue, saying they'll give Kim the same leeway during her cross-examination. Chuck continues saying that recording a confession would be his best bet as evidence, and that clearly Jimmy thought so too, considering that he broke in to destroy it. This isn't entirely true. Jimmy didn't just break in to destroy it due to it being evidence against himself, he did it due to feeling betrayed from Chuck. Chuck takes his leeway too far this time, with Kim objecting, saying how could anyone know what was happening inside Jimmy's head. This objection is sustained, with them just wanting to hear what happened. Chuck says that he recorded Jimmy to build a case against him, and he admits that he played up being ill from his condition, essentially acting to get the confession out of Jimmy. Chuck explains his condition as EHS, Electromagnetic Hypersensitivity Acute to Electromagnetism. When Chuck is accused of never being properly diagnosed, he brings up examples such as no one knowing about peanut allergies 30 years ago, AIDS not being properly identified until 1981, along with HIV only being discovered as the cause in 1983. Chuck says that his condition causes him great physical pain, but it doesn't affect his mental capacity to think clearly. Chuck is asked if he hates his brother, to which he says no, and that he loves him. Do you hate your brother? Absolutely not. I love my brother. There's nothing malicious in Jimmy. He elaborates that Jimmy has his reasons for doing the worst things that sound almost noble, and Jimmy's reaction makes it clear that Jimmy realizes this is also acting. He has a way of doing the worst things for reasons that sound almost noble. Chuck goes off on a righteous ramble about how important the law is, and that no one is above it, and how everyone should be held accountable. But what I know for sure is that the law is too important to be toyed with. 
It's mankind's greatest achievement. The rule of law, the idea that no matter who you are, your actions have consequences. And the way my brother treats the law, it breaks my heart. Chuck says that the way Jimmy mistreats the law breaks his heart, and that he's doing this to Jimmy to protect the law's integrity. I know it's hard to see right now, but Jimmy, this is an opportunity. That's why I'm doing this, not to punish you, to show you, truly show you, that you have to make a change. And the way my brother treats the law breaks my heart. That's why I did what I did, not to hurt him, but to protect something that I hold sacred. Before Kim cross-examines, she stalls again, and we see Rebecca walk into the room with Francesca, revealing that she was the person on the delayed flight that Jimmy and Kim were waiting for. Chuck asks for a moment to catch his breath, and a 15-minute recess gets called. Chuck greets Rebecca, saying that he's surprised that she's there, and that she doesn't have to be a witness. Rebecca says that she isn't a witness, and that she wishes Chuck told her about his condition, showing sympathy towards it. Chuck realized that Jimmy spilled the beans to Rebecca about his condition, under the ruse that he wanted her there for support, when Jimmy knows that it'll actually throw Chuck off his game. It's also revealed that Jimmy sent Rebecca pictures of the house, the same pictures that Mike took for Jimmy. I also assume that the note that Mike stole for Jimmy was Rebecca's contact info. Chuck says that he didn't tell Rebecca because he didn't want to worry her, and implies that she's upset because she now knows the truth. Rebecca even says that she should go, as she will just be a distraction, which is completely true. Chuck tells her to stay, saying that she's been sold a bill of goods, and he wants her to see what's what. Oh boy, will she ever, but not in the way that Chuck has in mind. Meanwhile, while outside the courtroom, Kim tells Jimmy that Rebecca is not what she expected, and that Rebecca is gonna hate Jimmy when this is over, knowing what they're about to do. Jimmy agrees. I love how Rebecca joins the courtroom. It adds extra tension to the situation, and it isn't even Jimmy's true ace in the hole, it's just an addition to it. This also emphasizes the Rebecca flashback so much and gives them a new and more important meaning. Back in the courtroom, Kim turns over cross-examination to Jimmy himself, bringing up the tape and how they never had a chance to properly discuss this. Well, there's been a lot of fuss about it, but you and I I've never really talked about this tape you made. We lost the opportunity when you burglarized my house to destroy it. Chuck says it's because Jimmy instantly destroyed it, but Jimmy still says that he wants to elaborate Chuck's story on how and why the tape was made. Jimmy accuses Chuck of using the cassette with his condition, and Chuck agrees that it caused him discomfort. Jimmy asks where it was hidden, and Chuck says that it was tucked under a space blanket. Jimmy asks Chuck to set the scene of how Chuck's house looked during the tape being recorded. Chuck admits that he covered his walls with foil insulation and mylar sheets, to which Jimmy adds, It was like being inside of a disco ball. Do you have a point? Jimmy says that Chuck entrapped him, which I kind of agree with. Chuck says that he just provoked an admission, which just sounds like fancy talk for entrapment, but I digress. Um, I'm impressed by how much work went into entrapping me. You went all out. I didn't entrap you. I provoked an admission in adverse interest. That's not the same thing. Jimmy asks Chuck how he knew it would work, and when Chuck doesn't respond, Jimmy says it's because Chuck knew it was the one thing that would worry Jimmy so much that he'd say anything to talk Chuck down. Chuck says that usually his house is normal, but Jimmy brings up pictures of the contrary, exposed wires, a camp stove, lanterns, etc. An objection is made in regards to Chuck's mental health already be confirmed not to be the issue, but Jimmy adds that they open it up to cross-examination by mentioning Chuck's play acting. In order to understand what I was thinking, you need to see Chuck through my eyes. You need to know if I believe that tape was evidence, and I say it was evidence of only one thing. My brother hates me. Jimmy says that the tape is evidence of only one thing, that Chuck hates him. Chuck claims that he lied to Jimmy to get him to confess, but Jimmy is now stating that he lied to Chuck to make him feel better. Uh, he claims that he lied to me to get me to tell the truth, and I'm telling you, I lied to my brother to make him feel better. Which of us you believe depends on how we all understand the mind of Charles McGill. Jimmy states how Chuck's symptoms began shortly after his divorce, and Chuck agrees. Jimmy asks when the last time he saw Rebecca was, but an objection is made in regards to how Chuck's divorce is relevant. Chuck butts in during this objection, saying that Jimmy got Rebecca to fly 4,000 miles to be there due to Chuck covering up his illness the last time that they saw each other, which was the flashback at the beginning of the episode. Episode. Chuck openly apologizes to Rebecca on the stand, saying that he didn't want her to think less of him for it. I'll tell you why my brother brought my ex-wife to this hearing. 4,000 miles she came. He knows I still have a lot of feeling for my ex-wife. He's hoping this will break me down. Chuck adds that Jimmy brought Rebecca to rattle him, hoping it would break him down. Although Chuck is reading this strategy like a book, it's still working, clear by Chuck's outburst in regards to Rebecca, along with what's about to happen next. Chuck interrupted the objection to try and foil Jimmy's plan by explaining how he's trying to manipulate Chuck with Rebecca, thinking that explaining it will defuse it and stop it in its tracks. But it still ends up working on him, and to be honest, it would've been better if Chuck never said anything in the first place and just let the objection go. 
Split me apart at the seams like a murderer confessing on an episode of Perry Mason. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Jimmy. Have I answered your questions to your satisfaction? Do you have anything else? Yeah, I do. Now, Jimmy raises a hypothetical, what if Chuck had lung cancer, would he have told Rebecca then? Chuck implies, probably yes, so Jimmy asks, how is this any different? Jimmy then wants examples of how Chuck's condition makes him feel, to which Chuck says a tightness in his chest, difficulty breathing, and overall general pain. Jimmy asks Chuck if it hurts right now, to which Chuck says that there's always mild discomfort, but that he appreciates everyone accommodating him during the situation. Jimmy looks at Francesca to leave the room, and then turns to Chuck, asking if he can feel the lights with them turned off, to which Chuck says no. Jimmy apologizes for them not being able to turn off the exit signs, to which Chuck responds saying that they aren't drawing much current and they're far away, and that intensity drops off with distance saying that the further away something it is, the stronger it needs to be to have an effect. Jimmy states that if he had a small battery from a watch or a phone and brought it close to Chuck's skin, that he'd feel it, and Chuck agrees. Jimmy then continues by asking Chuck if he can feel a current coming from any particular direction, along with asking where the nearest source is right now. Chuck doesn't respond but counters with a question. Jimmy, do you have something in your pocket? Yes, I do. As a matter of fact. Jimmy says yes and pulls out his phone, placing it on the stand, saying that Chuck should feel it, but he doesn't. Jimmy gets yelled at by the board, saying that he was supposed to leave his phone outside, but- May I? Just as I thought. No battery in here. You removed the battery. Sorry little trick, isn't it? Chuck says it's alright, picking up the phone to reveal it doesn't have a battery in it. Howard looked worried for a second, but smiles as Chuck tells Jimmy how that's a sorry little trick, but oh boy, just you wait. Chuck tells Jimmy that- <sighs> Don't you know by now this is real? I feel this. It's a physical response to stimuli. It's not a quirk. God, Jimmy. And asks what he has to do to prove it to him. Jimmy looks away, pondering what's about to happen next, and asks Chuck to reach into his breast pocket and tell him what's there. What do I have to do to prove it to you? I don't know, Chuck. Could you reach into your breast pocket and tell me what's there? Chuck reaches in, finds a phone battery, and drops it on the floor in front of him, startled. What now? Jimmy asks Chuck to confirm what it is, and defeatingly, Chuck says a battery. Jimmy then asks Chuck if he recognized the man in the back saying it's Huel Babineau, and Huel stands up. This is why Francesca left the room again to grab Huel. Can you tell the court what that was? A battery. Mr. Chairman, Did please. you recognize that man in back? His name is Huel Babineau. He's on our witness list. You bumped into him in the stairway. Jimmy says that Huel is on their witness list, and that Chuck bumped into him in the stairway, and that Huel will testify that he planted this fully charged battery battery on you over an hour and 43 minutes. An hour and 43 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Babineau. And you felt nothing. Chuck puts his hand on his chest in disbelief. As Jimmy says that Chuck felt nothing, putting the battery into his cell phone and showing that it is fully charged. As I mentioned during my season one tier list, we the audience were already shown proof that Chuck's condition was in his head when Dr. Cruz flipped on the electronic device at the end of Chuck's hospital bed without him realizing it, but only Kim and Jimmy witnessed it. This is the first time that Chuck has been proven to himself that his condition is in his head, as he would have felt the battery next to his heart. Not only is this revolutionary, it happens while Chuck is on the stand as a witness in front of the board, Howard, and even Rebecca in court. An objection is made that Chuck's mental illness is not the issue, and that even if he was schizophrenic, that it wouldn't affect anything. But Chuck interrupts by yelling out that he is not crazy, and everyone is taken back by this. If he were schizophrenic, Schiz it wouldn't take away from the fact that the I defendant- I am not crazy! This begins the moment that defines the court case along with Chuck's character and future as a whole. If Chuck could have just kept his calm, maybe things would have turned out okay. It's not just the fact that Jimmy played this battery chick on Chuck, outing him in front of everybody, but it's also mainly how Chuck responds. Yes, this is a direct response to Jimmy's actions, Jimmy is at fault for what happens to Chuck for the rest of the season, but Chuck's own lashing out is his true downfall. Chuck yells out that he's known for a fact that Jimmy switched the numbers from 1261 to 1216. One after Magna Carta as if I could ever make such a mistake. Never. Never. I just... I just couldn't prove it. Chuck states that Jimmy covered his tracks well, and that he got the employee at the photocopy store to lie for him. Although we as the audience know that pretty much everything Chuck is saying is true, Chuck's outburst sounds like the ramblings of a righteous man-man who can't admit when he's wrong, just kind of saying non sequiturs. He, he covered his tracks. He got that idiot at the copy shop to lie for him. That's billboard. He orchestrated. He defecated through a sunroof. Couldn't keep his hands out of the cash drawer. Stealing them blind. Jimmy. 
We then get the iconic line of Chuck saying, this chicanery, which the episode's named after. Mr. McGill, please, you don't have to go You think this is something, you think this is bad. This, this chicanery, he's done worse. Chuck accuses Jimmy of doing worse, such as the PR stunt with the worker falling off the billboard in season one. Chuck brings up Jimmy's Chicago sunroof and that he saved him, but took him into his own firm and shouldn't have. And I saved him, and I shouldn't have. I took him into my own firm. What was I thinking? Chuck yells out that Jimmy will never change ever since he was nine. Stealing money out of the cash register will mean while his parents loved him so much that they'd never believe it. Also implying that Chuck resents Jimmy for being a favorite child, even though Chuck is more successful and that he's had this vendetta against Jimmy since childhood. He'll never change ever since he was nine. Always the same, but not our Jimmy. Couldn't be precious Jimmy stealing them blind and he gets to be a lawyer. Chuck concludes by yelling out how preposterous it is that Jimmy gets to be a lawyer, calling it a, a sick joke. This confirms that Chuck resented Jimmy becoming a lawyer as the reason why he didn't give him a job at HHM, along with how and why his goal is to have Jimmy disbarred. I should have stopped him when I had the chance. And you, you have to stop him. You Chuck is giving a lifetime of hateful accusations towards Jimmy that have honestly nothing to do with the current trial, which proves Kim's and Jimmy's points earlier during the case that Chuck has always hated Jimmy throughout their brotherly relationship, even though Jimmy has only cared for him and wanted his approval. Chuck goes on to say that he should have stopped Jimmy when he had the chance, looking over at the board telling them that they have to stop him, but Chuck cuts himself off due to seeing the horrified and shocked looks on their faces. Chuck calms himself down and tries to apologize, but at this point, the damage is done. The episode ends with silence in the courtroom, after Chuck's outburst with the scene ending by showing the buzzing exit sign, signifying Chuck's condition once again, now knowing that it's mental. Rebecca is hiding her face with shame, most likely feeling secondhand embarrassment for Chuck in this moment. Howard looks displeased, knowing that if Chuck would have just taken his advice not to testify, that this would have never happened, and Chuck would have never made a fool of himself. Multiple times in the past, Howard suggested to Chuck that he should just stay home, and every time Chuck goes against Howard Howard's recommendation, he ends up making a fool out of himself. Just look at the incident with the Mesa Verde numbers and Chuck telling Paige and Kevin that they were muddying the waters. If Chuck wasn't there to lash out, it's possible that Howard could have handled it and they still would have had Mesa Verde as clients. Now Howard speaking to Chuck before the hearing also parallels Jimmy speaking to Chuck before Rebecca arrived in the flashback. People that care about Chuck always give him a suggestion on what the best option would be, but Chuck's stubbornness and righteous attitude always gets in the way and he turns them down just to later be burned by not taking their advice. He's hoping this will break me down, split me apart at the seams like a murderer confessing on an episode of Perry Mason. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Jimmy. I am not crazy. He defecated through a sunroof. This episode was essentially two and a half seasons worth of story, all blowing up in your face at once, something that this show doesn't do too often, but when they do, it's huge. This episode not only gets an S tier, but a double S tier. This episode is known as the greatest episode of Better Call Saul of all time, especially from the first four seasons, and for the most part, I'd have to agree. Episode 304 was mainly a cartel standout episode, and episode 305 is mainly a lawyer standout episode in the best way possible. Although episodes 302 and 304 are S-tier standard in my opinion, episode 305 is so amazing that it deserves to be rated on a higher tier than that. Going into these tier lists, I didn't think that I'd need to use the double S-tier ranking, but season 3 has proven me wrong. At the end of this video, I will also review my previous S-ranked episodes from previous seasons to see if they deserve to be bumped up to double S-tier. This also means that double S-tier will now be introduced in all future tier lists for Better Call Saul so get hyped for once we get to seasons 5 and 6. Season 3 episode 6 we're totally off brand here. After the title sequence, we see Kim giving her closing statements to the trial from the last episode, mentioning that elder clients of Jimmy willingly came to support their lawyer. Kim goes on to say that Jimmy dedicated the last three years of his life to caring for Chuck's well-being, his only blood relative. Kim does an amazing job propping up why Jimmy snapped when he realized that Chuck had betrayed him and used his love against him. Granted, Chuck's outburst made it easy on her, but Kim still did a great job portraying the relationship between the McGill brothers, which was her original intention ever since the start of the trial. Jimmy knows what he did was wrong, and he's ready to face the consequences, but he didn't have a premeditated agenda. Meanwhile, Rebecca goes to Chuck's house to try to speak to him, but Chuck is hiding in a corner with shame due to his outburst. Jimmy and Kim later pop a bottle in celebration of their job well done, with Jimmy saying that he has 12 short months until he can continue practicing law. Where are your notes? Let's uh, spread them out and roll around on them, see what happens. <laughs> 
Rebecca visits them at their office due to being unable to speak to Chuck, to which Jimmy says that Chuck is being dramatic. Rebecca wants Jimmy to go to Chuck's with her so that they can try and get into Chuck's house, thinking that for some reason Chuck will open the door for Jimmy. Rebecca then gets mad at Jimmy for not wanting to help, acting like he's the bad guy for screwing Chuck over like this. You got what you wanted. Now it's time to do what's right. Yeah. No. It's true that the battery trick was somewhat dirty along with tricking Rebecca to show up, but that doesn't excuse everything else that's happened between the brothers. Chuck has had his fair share of rolling around in the dirt too, whether he wants to admit it or not. I find Rebecca to be incredibly naive and ignorant at this moment, and her attitude has always rubbed me the wrong way. Obviously, she's been out of their lives for quite some time, and she was only there for half of the trial due to Jimmy tricking her to show up just to rattle Chuck. That being said, you'd think that she could put two and two together to realize that Jimmy isn't fond of Chuck after trying to help him so much just to repeatedly get stabbed in the back. Her naivete towards the situation is almost laughable, although I do see where she's coming from. She's just far too late to hop on the caring about Chuck bandwagon. The ship has sailed and I don't blame Jimmy for being cold in this moment. Rebecca's defense is that Chuck is mentally ill, shaming Jimmy for not helping. It's true that Chuck may be mentally ill, but I don't think that his condition can really excuse Chuck being the straight up stubborn asshole towards Jimmy that he has been. Just because Chuck was a prick to Rebecca in the flashback last episode to hide his condition, that does not mean that he was the same towards Jimmy. Jimmy knew about Chuck's condition and he tried helping him every step along the way, just to be given the cold shoulder time and time again. I do understand that the whole point of Rebecca's point of view here is to have an out of touch outside perspective, and her actor does an amazing job pulling this off. So we then see Howard visiting Chuck late at night, who once again is reluctant to open the door. Howard says that he's not leaving and that he doesn't want to wake the neighbors, but that he has all night. Chuck finally opens the door, and Howard reveals that he brought a bottle of McAllen to cheer him up. Howard tells Chuck that Jimmy has been suspended for 12 months. Usually they share a bottle after a career victory, which is what Howard is trying to play this off as, knowing that Chuck won't see it that way. This 12 month suspension is the slap on the wrist that Chuck was talking about in the last episode, when he wanted Jimmy to get permanently disbarred. Howard says that although it doesn't feel like a win, if Jimmy messes up during his 12 month probation, one year could turn into forever. Howard's trying to get Chuck to look on the bright side, saying it's inevitable that Jimmy will screw up. Howard tells Chuck that he can keep looking at the past and focusing on what Jimmy does, or he can move forward. Howard tries getting Chuck to quit his vendetta against Jimmy, saying that Jimmy isn't worth it. Howard and Chuck cheers to new beginnings, with Chuck reluctantly agreeing. Howard leaves and Chuck takes out a cassette tape holding the battery in his hand, trying to overcome his condition once and for all. The next day, we get a montage of Jimmy speaking to all of his elder clients over the phone. Next, 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 next. Next! Next! In order to tell them that he'll be taking a quote-unquote brief sabbatical from the law. I did? That's an honor. And how did he pass? Details will all be in the letter. It's just a technical thing, really. It's a technical, uh, it's an agreement. It's an agreement. This is a hilarious montage that I can't believe I completely forgot about. A letter with all the details, so... Okay, just, you stop, per, you stop talking and I'll talk. I don't know where those sounds are coming from, sir. Listen to you. Where'd you learn so much about lawyering? With the final call, Jimmy speaks to an actual pilot who praises Jimmy for his commercial that he made back in the season two episode, Fifi. Jimmy has a moment of feeling bad about tricking an elder pilot with a fake pilot commercial, but then quickly snaps into action in order to call the TV company running his ads to pull his commercial as he can't let his ads run anymore due to being suspended. Within the first day, he's already almost messed up. After, Jimmy tells Kim that he has nine airings left, meaning that he's out $4,000, along with the fact that Jimmy apparently isn't allowed to resell his airtime. They then discuss letting Francesca go, since Jimmy and Kim won't be needing a receptionist for the next year due to Jimmy being suspended and Kim having Mesa Verde as her only client. Not only does Jimmy not want to fire Francesca, Kim hits him with more bad news, that they'll have to move out of their season three office space as it's set up for two legal practices. Jimmy's now realizing all the sad ramifications of being suspended, as all he's ever wanted was to work a alongside Kim. Jimmy says that nothing's changed and that he'll keep paying for the law office that he's not even using, reluctant to give it all up. The next day, Jimmy goes to various businesses to try and sell his ad spots with a loophole that he'll still be producing the commercials, but for another business instead of his law practice. Jimmy vents to his camera crew about not finding a client to take his ad spots yet, being out another $400. In order to fill his airtime until he finds an actual client, he creates a commercial about selling his airtime. Jimmy rehearses his lines before shooting the commercial and complains that he's off-brand for his usual Gimme Jimmy persona that he's had in previous commercials. He complains about being Jimmy McGill, a lawyer you can trust, not some camera guy. He tries getting Drama Girl and 
the other members of the camera crew to say the lines for him, but it doesn't work. So we then see Chuck in a space blanket going outside of his house at night, and he starts walking down the middle of the road looking like a madman. Chuck makes his way to a commercial area at Albuquerque, and I love the blue lens flares on all the lights, along with the intense score in the background, indicating how Chuck's condition is affecting him while he's trying to persevere through it. Chuck uses a public payphone to speak to Dr. Laura Cruz, the doctor that Chuck saw in both seasons 1 and 2. Chuck asks to see her ASAP, implying that he does want help to beat his condition. Later at Kim's apartment, Jimmy gets a client for his ad spots. She's actually sleeping at home instead of at her office, but she just shrugs it off saying that she needed clean clothes. Jimmy explains this loophole to Kim and that his clients will pay him to make a commercial and that he throws in the quote unquote airtime for free. Jimmy then shows Kim the finished commercial that he shot that day to advertise his commercial spots. Very meta makes a commercial for commercials. Jimmy lowers Kim's expectations, saying it isn't his best work, but Kim insists. The effects and transitions used in this commercial are such an early 2000s vibe and I love it. The commercial ends with Jimmy calling himself Saul Goodman, although his outfit does not reflect what we know as Saul Goodman later on in the timeline. Saul Goodman? Yeah, it's like Saul Good, man. Kim is shocked, saying that Saul Goodman has a lot of energy. The episode ends with Jimmy saying it's just a name, but oh boy is that ever one of the biggest understatements of the show. That guy has a lot of energy. It's just a name. Huh. This is the very first time that we've chronologically seen Jimmy professionally use the Saul Goodman name during the Breaking Bad Better Call Saul timeline, even though he has had the name as a pun ever since Cicero, as shown during Season 1 flashbacks. Now on the cartel side of the show, Episode 306 starts with Hector and Nacho at the taco shop, as Nacho now accepts the cash payments alone, because Tuco is in prison. Crazy 8 shows up and gives an excuse about being short due to one of his guys messing up. Nacho says he's light, asking why he couldn't make it up on his own end. Crazy 8 says that he did, but he couldn't make it all up. Since Nacho and Crazy 8 are lifelong friends, Nacho lets him off easy, telling him to make it up next week. As he leaves, Hector jokes to Nacho, Who works for who? Huh? Hector is implying that Nacho is being too soft, to the point that Nacho works for Crazy 8 and not the other way around. Nacho then feels forced to go out and beat up Crazy 8 to satisfy Hector, showing how the cartel is further corrupting him. Later that night, Nacho is working at his father's upholstery store and ends up accidentally sewing through the webbing of his hand due to being so shaken up by beating up Crazy 8, showing that this is negatively affecting Nacho. We see Stacy and Mike at a support group as Stacy talks about Maddie. She tells a sweet story about making Kaylee pancakes like how Maddie used to, along with how Kaylee wants to know more about Maddie's work and do a career day at school. Stacy debates whether she's going to open up about Maddie's police work to Kaylee, especially due to knowing the truth about how dirty cops killed Maddie, along with the fact that she'd have to hide that from Kaylee. Stacy reveals to Mike that she signed him up to help build a new playground by pouring concrete, and with some pushing, Mike reluctantly agrees. Stacy mentions how Mike and Maddie built a carport when Maddie was a kid, and that Mike let Maddie put his handprint on the concrete, but Mike doesn't even remember. We then get a classic Los Pollos truck drug smuggling montage, showing how Gus hides his product under the floorboards to his delivery trucks. Nacho and Arturo pick up product from Tyrus and Victor, but they try to take one more than they're supposed to. Nacho says that Hector wants six bricks and not five, causing Victor to hold Nacho at gunpoint while Tyrus calls Gus. Gus tells Tyrus to allow Nacho to take the sixth brick, not wanting to cause problems with Hector. It's revealed that when Gus took the call from Tyrus, he was actually looking around the laundry location that he would eventually buy to hide the super lab under. After walking around and checking it out, he goes back to a vehicle which is revealed to have Lydia in it. She asks him about it, and he says it could work. This is not only the first time we've seen Lydia in Better Call Saul, it's the earliest we've ever seen Lydia chronologically in the Breaking Bad Better Call Saul timeline. Also, although Lydia and Gus obviously knew each other during Breaking Bad, this is their first ever scene together, due to Lydia not really being introduced into Breaking Bad until season Season 5 after Gus was already dead. I remember this scene exciting me in anticipation of setting up the Super Lab, but in hindsight the Season 4 Super Lab arc is one of my least favorite arcs of the show, we'll discuss that more in the next tier list. So Nacho and Arturo later speak to Hector about taking an extra brick of drugs, telling Hector that Victor put a gun to Nacho's head. Hector is unpleased with this, and starts talking to Nacho about his father. He asks Nacho where his father gets his upholstery to see if he can use his father's business to smuggle drugs across the border. Hector says that Gus smuggling his drugs 
drugs are temporary and wants to make a new legitimate business to start smuggling due to Mike having his previous ice cream business busted. Nacho tries pleading with Hector that his father isn't in the business, but Hector forces him into it, saying not to worry about it. Don't Hector, please. Don't worry, I take good care of puppy. He make money a lot more than with his little sewing machine. So in a way, Mike unintentionally set Hector's crosshairs on Nacho and his father, putting them both in potential danger, which leads to the reasons why Nacho does what he does for the rest of the season, along with the entire show in general, and his overall fate. So Arturo comes back inside after taking a phone call and informs Hector that Tuco increased his prison sentence due to knifing someone in Los Lunas. Hector freaks out and starts having heart problems. This not only gives exposition for why Tuco doesn't come back into the show soon, it also gives Nacho an idea to take Hector out. Looks like Tuco knifed the guy. What? All he had to do was six months! He'd be in there forever! <laughs> I will mention how great of a job Hector's actor, Mark Mongolis, does here, as I love the pre-wheelchair scenes with Hector where he speaks. I love his cadence, such as the way that he calls Nacho's father Poppy, along with his freakout scenes. This episode gets a solid B tier. It's a great aftermath episode to the chicanery of episode 305, and sets up multiple arcs for the rest of the season, and the show in general. Season 3, Episode 7. Man, we got expenses, man. You, exp you don't have expenses. I've got expenses. This episode shows Jimmy doing his mandatory community service that he's been assigned to with his suspension. And I love the cinematography of Jimmy standing against the brick wall waiting for his bus. Jimmy's asked to sign a waiver, but he has to read it first due to the fact that he's a lawyer. He's told it's just a waiver and reluctantly signs it without reading it. Once they get to their location, Jimmy puts on his reflector vest and grabs a trash bag and some tongs to start picking up garbage below a highway underpass. Jimmy starts answering phone calls under Saul Goodman for his commercial ad spots while still picking up garbage at the same time. This would have been a perfect time for Jimmy to invest in a Bluetooth earpiece, something that Saul Goodman is eventually iconic for in the future. Jimmy also calls in to get his malpractice insurance cancelled for the year. At the end of the day, Jimmy only gets 30 minutes of community service after being out there for 4 hours due to Jimmy's time not counting while he was on his phone. What an absolute hard ass this guy is. He could have just told Jimmy that after the first phone call, but kept letting him take calls while secretly docking him. This is the first of many dominoes to fall in this episode that negatively affects Jimmy. After getting off the bus ride home, Jimmy runs to his car and cleans himself off and changes in the parking lot, rushing to get to a client. Jimmy's car doesn't start at first, but he eventually gets it going. Jimmy films a commercial at a furniture reclining store, directing the store owner quite well. The store owner only agreed to do one commercial, but Jimmy tries pushing him to buy every single ad spot. He tells Jimmy that he can't due to not being able to afford it and that his wife would be mad if he did. Jimmy Sweens the deal even more, but the owner tells Jimmy that he could only take the deal if he paid with credit, while Jimmy can only take cash. Jimmy gets paid for a single commercial, and gives almost all of it away to pay his camera crew. Joey asks if they can just split it four ways, saying they have expenses, but Jimmy low-key flips on him, saying that he has his own expenses, which he's clearly stressed about. Uh, can we make this easier, just split it four ways? Split it four- I'll split you four ways. Don't they teach you capitalism in that school of yours? Now, speaking of expenses, Jimmy and Kim later account for their expenses, with Kim being about $3,000 dollars over threshold, while Jimmy's about a thousand dollars short. Kim is surprised by all of Jimmy's cash to pay it off, asking him if the TV gig is showing a profit. Jimmy lies and says that it is, but Kim accuses him of just draining his bank account. To keep up the front in regards to not being short for cash, Jimmy orders Chinese food and insists on paying for it. While actually paying, however, Jimmy gives the delivery guy only a one dollar tip. When the delivery driver seems unimpressed, Jimmy says we can make it zero and shuts the door on him. This is an example of shit rolling down him. Hill, as this is the same line that the community service supervisor told Jimmy at the beginning of the episode. Come on, 30 minutes, that's, that's not right. You could do better than that. We could make it zero. Yeah, keep the change. A dollar. Yeah, we can make it zero. So Kim takes a short 5 minute power nap in her car before going into Mesa Verde, and the director and editor both did an excellent job portraying just how jarring this is, cutting to Kim waking up immediately after falling asleep. This was a very relatable moment, and I love it, and I think it's kind of underrated. Kim gets praised by Paige for the way that her and Jimmy perfectly set up Chuck in court. Kim is obviously bothered by this, but keeps up a fake smile, at least at first. When Paige keeps complaining about the rates of opening banks in different states being different, Kim gives somewhat of a smartass remark, tossing the guidelines on the table. Paige caves and agrees that the numbers were right in the first place, causing Kim to apologize due to how rude she just was. She says that in regards to Chuck, all they did was tear down a sick 
Jake Mann. Kim was rude not only due to being bothered by Paige bringing up Chuck's trial, but also since she's so sleep deprived. We then cut back to Jimmy who once again rushes off of his community service bus to clean himself off in the parking lot due to having another commercial to film. Jimmy speeds to another parking lot to get the camera crew, but after stuffing all their supplies into the trunk, his car won't start. The camera crew keeps hassling Jimmy that he's flooding it while he keeps trying to start the car, clearly even more stressed out. They end up taking the bus to a music store, but these store owners prove to be total a-holes. They say that they're having second thoughts due to the commercial costing too much money, along with complaining about the time slot. Jimmy even offers them 50% off, but they cancel. Jimmy desperately tells them that he'll film the first commercial for free, in hopes that they'll be happy enough with it to buy future commercial and time slots due to seeing all the new customers that the initial free commercial will bring in. The music store owners agree, and they film the first commercial for free. Jimmy still pays the camera crew $100 each, even though he never got paid himself, putting himself in even more of a hole. Jimmy sits down on the sidewalk, feeling defeated and depressed. The camera crew can tell, but they start to leave for the bus. Now the drama girl stays behind and tries to give Jimmy back her $100, telling him the obvious that he's losing money. This act of sympathy is sweet, but Jimmy declines, saying it's fine. Jimmy and Kim sit in their office, but Jimmy convinces her to go out, telling her that she has to drive due to his car being broken down. They go out to the same restaurant that they've conned in before, and they start people watching, joking about potentially conning them. One of their plans involves Jimmy pretending to be Kevin Costner, but Kim doesn't believe he looks like him. This is a funny reference to Jimmy lying to a woman about being Kevin Costner in the season 1 finale, which was originally a story that Saul told Walt in Breaking Bad. I once convinced a woman that I was Kevin Costner, and it worked because I believed it. You are not Kevin Costner. I was last night. Kevin Costner. I will go stand in that corner. You're meeting Kevin Costner. You don't look like Kevin Costner. I look exactly like Kevin Costner. Jimmy finds a real a-hole and starts getting way too into the idea of hatefully conning him, making Kim take a metaphorical step back, reminding him that they're just talking and not actually gonna do it. Kim asks Jimmy if there's another way to handle Chuck, feeling bad about what Rebecca said to them. Jimmy tells her that everything that happened was Chuck's own fault and that he's not worth thinking about. I like the parallel of Jimmy telling Kim to not think Think about Chuck, similar to Howard telling Chuck to not think about Jimmy. And Chuck, listen to me. Jimmy's just not worth it. He is not worth thinking about. Also, Jimmy clearly has no remorse to what happened in episode 305, but oh boy, just wait until the finale in season 4. Kim then picks out a person for them to discuss conning, and the scene ends. This is similar to Kim going back to paperwork with Paige after telling Paige what she thought about how they handled Chuck. Just kind of an awkward way to change the subject. Fixed mortgage rates. There's an acquisition comparison at the top, and you want to go by total... Yeah. I bet we could get him to invest in some of Giselle St. Clair's land in South Africa. Mining rights would be all his. Now the next day, Jimmy goes into his insurance to try and get it cancelled, as foreshadowed at the beginning of the episode. Jimmy tells her to look up the name McGill, to which she finds Chuck first, and Jimmy corrects her that that's his brother, and to look up James McGill instead. Jimmy explains that his license has been suspended for a year, but is denied a refund. Yet another moment where he can't catch a break. Now not only will she not refund his insurance or put it on hold, she tells him that once he's reinstated, his insurance will increase by 150% due to the suspension. It's hard. Very, very hard. Jimmy starts breaking down, and Bob's acting here is brilliant. Jimmy starts venting to the insurance lady about all of his problems, including Chuck. Jimmy slips that Chuck is mentally ill, and that he had a mental breakdown in court. The insurance lady takes note of this, causing Jimmy to tell her not to do anything, and that he doesn't want to get Chuck in trouble because of him. As Jimmy leaves, he shows a huge grin on his face, implying how getting Chuck in trouble is actually exactly what he wanted to do. What an amazing way to end off the episode. Now, I actually tweeted Tom Schnoz about this in regards to if Jimmy had a premeditated plan to screw over Chuck's insurance, or if Jimmy just thought of it in the moment. Tom confirmed that it was an in-the-moment decision, laying to rest one of the biggest debates to come from Season 3. Now on the cartel side of the show, we get the return of Price as he enters his home. He's shown to have a security system along with a hilarious amount of locks on his door, getting his added security after Nacho stole his baseball cards. To his surprise, he finds Nacho already inside his home waiting for him. I absolutely love Price's reaction here, as Nacho responds just by saying that he wants to talk. Ah! Jeez! What the hell? 
I mean, what the hell? How'd you get in here? Nacho says that he wants to do business, but Price is still too hung up on Nacho stealing his cards, saying an apology is all he wants to talk about. Nacho asks Price if he can get a pack of Hector's heart medication, but with the capsules empty before they're sealed. Price wonders why, but Nacho keeps quiet, saying that he'll pay Price $20,000 if he gets the capsules. Remember that Nacho made $60,000 last season by selling Price's flashy Hummer after giving back his baseball cards, so this doesn't completely pay back Price, but it's enough that Price is interested. The next day, Mike is pouring concrete for the playground and initially turns down help from members of the support group. Mike eventually caves and accepts their help, but gives the woman the short end of the stick due to possibly being old-fashioned with gender roles, or maybe he's just trying to be polite, but it's coming off as rude, I'm not sure. Now the woman starts helping anyways, smoothing the pavement. Mike picks up a broom, offending the woman as she thinks that he's being sexist and telling her to sweep. He tells her that it's so she can add texture to the concrete instead of it being completely smooth, so the kids won't slip and fall on it when it gets wet. The woman introduces herself as Anita, and Mike thanks her for helping. That night, Mike starts a graveyard toll booth shift and finds Price waiting in his car for him due to wanting to hire Mike as protection again. Mike declines and starts walking away until Price mentions that it's for Nacho. Price says how Nacho broke into his house, confused as to how Nacho got past his security system. Mike explains that all Nacho had to do was unplug Price's phone lines, since basic 2000 security systems were pretty archaic by today's standards, and I actually like how the show explains this. Price tells Mike that Nacho wants empty Lydra cell capsules and was offered a bunch of money for it. Mike tells Price that he's still not interested, and for Price to find a way out of it. Mike realizes that the capsules were for Hector, and that Nacho is planning something against him. Mike doesn't want to get in involved with aiding a hit against Hector due to Gus telling Mike that he wants Hector still alive, obviously stopping Mike from killing Hector in the season 2 finale. He also tells Price to make up an excuse to give Nacho probably due to Gus being a threat to anyone involved. We then see another support group meeting, with Anita speaking about her late husband. Mike speaks to Anita afterwards, asking if he was a cop. She says no and that he was a Navy man, long out of service. Anita explains that her husband went missing while hiking 8 years ago, and that his body was never found. It's possible her husband husband could have witnessed criminal activity and was killed for it. This speaks to Mike due to having a soft spot for people not in the game being killed due to association, not only because of his own son, but also due to the innocent civilian that was killed after finding the driver of Hector's truck that Mike robbed. Mike steps outside to call Price, asking if he's made the deal with Nacho yet. Price says not yet, and Mike tells him that he's in. Mike and Price meet Nacho at the same season 2 meeting spot, but late at night. Mike says that he needs to know what Nacho's planning, but explains that he already has it all figured out and just wants the details. Mike asks how Nacho's gonna make the switch, along with how he's gonna stop the cartel from finding out it was him. Nacho thinks that Mike is trying to stop him, but Mike says no, that he just wants Nacho to know what he's getting into. Nacho has no choice due to Hector wanting to use his father to smuggle drugs. Since his father is a straight arrow, he will go to the police, which will get him killed. Nacho asks Mike a rhetorical question saying, you don't think I know what I'm dealing with? But Mike responds saying, no you don't, since Mike knows about Gus's interests while Nacho does not. I love how Mike checks Nacho's gas cap to make sure that Gus isn't following him. This isn't the only time that Mike checks someone else's gas cap, but we'll discuss that during a future tier list. Mike tells Nacho that there's more people than the Salamancas to worry about, telling Nacho that if he manages to switch the pills that he'll have to switch them back after Hector goes down. Before they do the deal, Mike will need one more thing from Nacho, but the scene ends before we learn what that is. This episode gets an A tier. I love episodes that make me feel emotion, and this episode makes me feel pissed off, but in a good way. You really feel for all the bad things happening to Jimmy, where everyone's giving him the short end of the stick, and he just cannot catch a break, no matter how hard he tries. Plus, all of this leading to the moment where he screws over Chuck's insurance is brilliant. The acting that Bob Odenkirk does in this episode is amazing, especially when he's down on his luck sitting on the curb, along with obviously speaking to the insurance lady at the end of the episode. Season 3 Episode 8 Slip. This episode starts with a flashback to Jimmy and Marco breaking into his father's old abandoned corner store. Jimmy and Marco reminisce about skipping school to go hide in the back room where Jimmy's mom would do paperwork for the store, telling her that they had a free period at school. Jimmy's mom would give Marco a pack of cookies, even though he says that she probably knew that they were skipping. Jimmy jokes about those little Debbies being what ran them out of business. As we know, Jimmy's father lost his store not only due to being financially naive, giving out too many handouts, but also potentially due to Jimmy stealing from the cash register after the wolves and 
cheap flashback. Jimmy's father died not long after the store closed. Jimmy searches the roof for his iconic Band-Aid box with his childhood coin collection in it. Jimmy used to hide rare coins in the Band-Aid box as a kid, and they want to use these coins to run coin scams such as the one that we saw in Season 1. While they wait for cops to pass, Jimmy explains the story of his coin collection. He found a rare quarter once and told his father it was rare and worth like 4 bucks. Jimmy's father ran out into the parking lot to try and return it to the customer but couldn't find him. His father then taped it to the register, hoping the customer would come back one day but he never did. Jimmy eventually stole it and from then on constantly checked the register for rare coins and when he found one, he'd stick it in his band-aid box and hide it in the roof. Marco says it's a crying shame that the store got shut down and that they worked so hard for it. Jimmy says that they should have never bought the place and- Yeah, they worked hard. They worked a lot of hours for a lot of years for nothing. Marco argues that everyone liked Jimmy's parents, but Jimmy argues back that the people just liked them because they were easy to con and steal. As they go to leave, Jimmy doubles back to grab his band-aid box, which becomes very important during future Gene scenes. In the current timeline, Dr. Cruz is meeting Chuck at his house while he shows her his condition logbook, including locations of where his condition acts up, the origin of the cause, pain out of 10, and also doses of the medicine. Chuck positively mentions how he used to have pain logged from up to 7s and 8s, whereas now he's down to 3s and fours. Chuck explains his aspirations to beat this condition and go back to work full-time without any accommodations, along with installing lights and electronics back into his house. They then discuss the night that Chuck called her on the payphone, and Dr. Cruz asked Chuck why it was so important to speak to her. It was proven to me, and beyond the shadow of a doubt, that there was a battery, a fully charged battery, almost next to my skin for the better part of two hours, and I felt nothing. Chuck explains that he recently had a public incident, stating it might have been the worst experience of his life. Chuck admits that it was proven to him that his condition was mental due to the battery trick played on him by Jimmy. Absolutely love this self-awareness that Chuck is showing, and it's some excellent acting by Michael McKean. This condition, to me it's as real as that chair, it's as real as this house, it's as real as you. What if it's not? What if it's all in my head? And if that's true, if it's not real, then what have I done? Meanwhile, at the music shop, one of the store owners tells Jimmy that it's the busiest day they've had in the last six months due to his free commercial. The other owner comes to give Jimmy a hard time, saying how he doesn't even work for the station, and that he's figured out what Jimmy is doing to sell his airtime. They also start giving Jimmy a hard time on the $6,500 pricing for seven commercials, saying that the station only charges $450 per airing, which would only be $3,150. Jimmy adds that the extra price is due to production, but the owners argue, wondering why they even need to film new commercials instead of just airing the same one that they are already have. They ask to pay Jimmy $4.50 for the commercial they already made, and that they'll take it from there, implying that they'll just take the commercial to the station if Jimmy doesn't agree with the $4.50 per airing fee. Jimmy argues that the commercial doesn't actually belong to them, and that it's property of Saul Goodman Productions. The owners get offended at this, saying that the $4.50 is off the table, and they then insult the camera crew, belittling them as just UNM students, saying that they can get the same kind of crew themselves if they wanted. I hate these store owners so much, they're such a-holes. That being said, I gotta praise the actors for doing such an amazing job portraying these characters, as you're obviously supposed to hate them. Jimmy is clearly pissed off and fed up with people treating him like crap for the last three episodes or so, so he decides to get back at these a-hole store owners with the most classic con he knows. That's right, we finally get to see Jimmy do a slip and Jimmy slip and fall, which is what episodes 608 and 609 are named after, 608 being slip and 609 being fall. Jimmy tells Joey to roll his camera in Jimmy's direction, and then purposely moves a drumstick onto the floor without anyone seeing due to the owners being busy with customers. Jimmy then approaches the owners, asking if there's any wiggle room, to which they rudely say, We are with customers right now. <sighs> Please, all right? Just go. Just go. Goodbye. Go. Jimmy then purposely slips on the drumstick, taking a hell of a fall. The camera crew rushes to his aid, telling someone to call for an ambulance. Jimmy says not to, but tries to get up and plays up how much pain he's in, saying that, yes, he needs an ambulance. Jimmy then looks at the store owners who are now standing above him, asking them if they have liability insurance. What a classic slippin' Jimmy way of getting back at them, I love it so much. Meanwhile, Kim is having a lunch meeting with Kevin and Paige, with Kevin asking Kim to help out with his friend who's a driller with an issue between the Texas and New Mexico border. Kim notices Howard walking in with some clients and tries not to let it bother her, but of course Howard walks over to their table to catch up, trying to keep things positive but unintentionally coming off as a condescending prick. Again, I don't think that Howard meant anything by this as his character just naturally comes across as a prick even when he's trying to be nice. However, Kim has a tendency to get offended by Howard and what he says to her. Kim excuses herself from the table with Paige and Kevin to go write a check, and then walks over to Howard's table to give it to him. Then outside after lunch, Howard confronts Kim about the check, asking her 
her what it's about. Kim says that it never sat right with her that HHM paid off her law school fees, to which Howard says that it sat right with her at the time. This is clearly an excuse by Kim, while the check was actually a passive-aggressive stab back at Howard and he realizes this. Howard says that he's doing damage control, having restaurant meetings with clients three meals a day due to Chuck's public outburst on trial ruining HHM's reputation. Howard states that he's not cashing her check and rips it up in front of her. Now I discussed this more in my video specifically about why Jimmy and Kim hate Howard, so go check that out if you want. Chuck goes grocery shopping himself for the first time in three years, trying to control his condition by repeating what he sees to himself in some sort of calming technique, which just makes him sound more crazy. White sign. Red pepper. Purple sweater. Brown wood. Black mat. <sighs> Chuck gets directed to the soy milk, but has to walk down the freezer aisle to do so, which really bothers him. When Chuck gets home, Howard's there waiting for him, impressed to see that he walked to get groceries by himself. I love how Chuck is trying to make himself better, once again giving the viewers false hope that he will fully recover. I decided to go for the little walk. That's great, Chuck. <laughs> Let's go in. Uh, thank you. Sadly, this is just the calm before the storm, as Howard has bad news about his malpractice insurance. Back at their office, Kim walks in to see Jimmy laying on the floor, roughly playing Smoke on the Water with a new guitar. Jimmy says that he sold the rest of his ads, implying that he worked out a deal with the music shop owners where instead of suing them for his slip and fall, he convinced them to pay for the rest of the ad spots, along with clearly throwing in a guitar. Jimmy lies to Kim about it, just saying that the shop owners were so impressed by all the traffic the ads brought to their store that they threw in the guitar for free. Kim questions why Jimmy's laying on on the floor, and he says that he fell, but not on purpose. This, my back hurts like hell, and uh, people suck. She asks if he went to a doctor, but he says he'll be fine, as we know that he's clearly done the slip and fall scams in the past. Jimmy gives Kim half of the office payments for the next six weeks, but he's salty about it. That's my half. It's good for the next six weeks, so at least we can stop talking about that. Kim offers to cover his half for the next few weeks while he heals, telling him to also take a break from his community service until he's all healed up. Jimmy appreciates the offer, but declines, wanting to keep up his end. I could cover our expenses for a while. Kim, you get the cash in your hand. Yeah, I know. So what are you talking about? All I'm saying is... Kim is so busy that her days are starting to blur together, again implying how overworked she is. Sleeping in your own bed tonight. Things must be looking up. I needed clean clothes. I saw you yesterday. You were fine. Uh, that was Tuesday. You picked up clean clothes, remember? Even so, she ends up accepting the Gatwood driller job. The next day, we see Jimmy at community service, getting metaphorically whipped by the supervisor due to his back still hurting. He sees a fellow worker plea with the supervisor to be able to leave due to his kids sick in the hospital hospital, but the supervisor denies him credit if he does. Jimmy speaks to the worker, asking him how much he's willing to pay to get out of community service. Jimmy correctly profiles him as a dealer, saying he'll get him out while allowing him to keep his hours. Jimmy says it'll cost $700, calling him out for having a couple grand in his sock. The worker agrees, and Jimmy goes to lay on the ground. The supervisor walks over, and Jimmy says that he's resting due to a sore back. The supervisor says that he won't get hours, but Jimmy says that he will, and that if he doesn't, he'll sue the supervisor personally. You can't do that. Buddy, this is the land of the free and the home of the lawsuit. I sure as shooting can. Jimmy threatens that he'll bring in the other worker and make it a class action lawsuit, since the supervisor knowingly prevented the worker from visiting his child in the hospital, calling it intentional infliction of emotional distress. Jimmy adds that he can sue for failure to provide community service hours, which is a direct violation. Jimmy adds on failure to treat and mitigate damages suffered under his supervision, claiming that he hurt his back while doing community service. Jimmy admits that he may not win the lawsuit, but explains how much a legal defense will cost the supervisor in the long run, saying how he'll be pouring money down the drain until he's broke. Shit, the waiver clearly oh, that stayed. That waiver's gonna make Swiss cheese look solid. The supervisor agrees to let Jimmy rest and to let the other worker leave while they both get to keep their hours. Out here, you might be King Douche Nozzle, but in court, you are little people. The worker tells Jimmy that this was the best $700 he's ever spent. Throw some shit on my shit right there. Also, the worker saying to go visit his kid is clearly a lie, the worker's a drug dealer, and he wants to go make a deal. Now, I love how this episode shows Jimmy using his conning talents to screw over everyone that was punching down on him in the past few episodes. The music store owners, the community service supervisor, and even Chuck in regards to his insurance, although some cons end up having larger, unintended consequences as originally thought, but we'll discuss that more by the end of the video. On the cartel side of the show, we get a montage of Mike returning to the location that he robbed Hector's truck in order to try and find the innocent civilian that was murdered due to helping out the truck driver. I love this montage of Mike using a metal detector to try and find the body, eventually finding it due to the body having a ring on his finger. It's lucky that Mike found the body due to the ring, but also unlucky as it was a marriage ring, meaning that the Good Samaritan had a family. Mike ends up calling the cops on a payphone and gives them a tip as to
to where the body is, but stays anonymous and hangs up. Mike did this because he wanted to give the Good Samaritan's family closure due to Anita's story about her missing husband really bothering Mike, seeing how she never got closure for what happened to him. Now we later see a montage of Nacho filling the empty capsules from Price with ibuprofen, along with practicing throwing the pill bottle into a jacket on the back of a chair, which really does a good job at adding tension to when he actually does it for real. Later that night, Nacho sneaks on top of the taco shop, sabotaging the AC to guarantee that Hector will take off his blazer the next day. Hector does exactly that as Nacho counts Crazy 8's money. Nacho brings a bill to Hector, wondering if it's fake, and he drops some cash on the floor, giving him the opportunity to steal Hector's pill bottle. This scene is so intense and I love it. Nacho goes back to his table, secretly putting his fake pills into Hector's pill bottle between his legs, swapping the pills. Nacho is shaking while he's doing so, showing how nervous he is to swap the pills. We then get the intense moment of Nacho throwing Hector's pill bottle into his pocket. Nacho was practicing the throw last night but kept missing, making this so much more tense as Nacho actually gets the pill bottle into Hector's pocket successfully. As Nacho grabs Hector more espresso after successfully throwing the pill bottle, his hands are still shaking. This was such an iconic moment out of season 3, as I absolutely love seeing the origins of why Hector eventually ends up in a wheelchair. The slow motion as Nacho does this is a great touch too. Meanwhile, we see Mike going into his closet to take out his ill-gotten gains from robbing Hector's truck. He takes the money to Los Poyos, telling Gus he has about $200,000 that he can't spend and needs it to be laundered so he can give it to his family. Mike calls out Gus for opening Los Poyos to launder his own money and asks for a one-time arrangement for Gus to launder his money for him as well. Gus says that they shouldn't be publicly affiliated in case the Salamancas see that and put two and two together. Gus says that he can arrange something, but it'll be more difficult. Mike tries bribing Gus with 20% of the money that he launders for him, but Gus says he won't take money from Mike's family. This is incredibly noble of Gus considering Breaking Bad spoilers here. In the future, he's the person that tells Walt that he'll murder his infant daughter, although Gus clearly has more respect for Mike than Walt. I figure Gus is trying to put on a front here to leave a good impression on Mike as he wants Mike to start working for him permanently. Gus and Mike shake hands, ending off the episode. What a great ending. I love seeing the origin story on how Gus and Mike joined forces this season. This episode gets an A tier. Honestly, I was feeling a B tier for this episode, but I forgot this was the episode where we see Nacho swap Hector's pills. I misremembered it being in 309 when it actually happens in 308. I also almost didn't give this episode an A tier because a lot of the other scenes in this episode are forgettable. They're good, but don't necessarily leave a lasting impact, but I do love the moments such as the pill swap along with Mike and Gus. Season 3 Episode 9 Fall. This episode starts with Jimmy pulling into a parking lot and opening store-bought cookies to place on a paper plate. He visits Irene and gives her the cat cookies, but lies, saying that he baked them himself. He later tells her that the cookies look like her cats, and she agrees, saying that he's so thoughtful. Jimmy brings up the Sandpiper case with Irene, saying that it's years away from being settled. Jimmy acts surprised as she elaborates, saying that Aaron told her that there's a long way to go, and I love Jimmy clenching his teeth, pretending to compliment Aaron. Aaron says we should wait. Do you know her? Oh, yes, I, I have met her. It's a, it's a wonderful young lady. Yeah. He asks Irene if she was sent any paperwork, and she shows him everything that she has. Jimmy's taken back by the huge sum of $17.4 million that's been offered to Irene, surprised that she hasn't settled yet. Irene says Aaron told her to wait, but Jimmy explains how Aaron doesn't matter and that Irene is the class representative who really decides. You really should talk to Aaron. She knows all the ins and outs. Yeah, Aaron sure knows those. <laughs> they get interrupted by Irene's friends, who are also former clients of his. I love how much these elders adore Jimmy, it just breaks my heart on what he's about to do next. As Jimmy leaves, he does the math, calculating how much his share of the settlement is, being $1,160,000. <laughs> Holy shit! I love the way that he freaks out as the show goes into the intro sequence. Back at HHM, Howard and Chuck are having a meeting about their malpractice insurance, saying how their insurance premiums are getting doubled for every attorney that's employed due to Chuck's outburst on trial in episode 305. Chuck threatens litigation if the insurance company doesn't do right by them, causing the meeting to end. Chuck begins discussing a plan of action while Howard pours them a few glasses of booze. Howard implies that Chuck should theoretically retire, keeping his name on the building, but he'd no longer be a practicing lawyer. Howard tries telling Chuck that there's more to life than this, but Chuck is stubborn in his ways to get back at work again, as that's been his goal the entire show, especially since he's currently trying so hard to beat his condition. What if it's not a suggestion? Meaning? Meaning if enough people tell you that you're drunk, maybe it's time to sit down. Chuck doesn't appreciate this suggestion of retiring, but Howard says it's not a suggestion. Howard says that the insurance is the final straw that broke the camel's back, and that this is really about his condition. Chuck tries proving that he's getting better by turning all the lights back on and holding a table light up to his face, but Howard isn't convinced. Howard, I'm fine! 
This is not what fine looks like. Howard tells Chuck that he's the best legal mind he's ever known, but that his decision making has become unpredictable. Keep in mind that Howard has tried convincing Chuck to back down from his vendetta against Jimmy and Kim every step of the way, but Chuck has pushed and pushed, digging himself into a hole. Howard says that he can't be partners with someone's judgment he doesn't trust, and Chuck leaves the room. Meanwhile, Kim is at her new drilling client in regards to his feud with the Texas-New Mexico border. Kim offers a payoff solution, saying that she can get it done in two weeks. As Kim goes to leave, her tire gets stuck in the dirt. She manages to shove wood planks under a wheel to push the car free, but her car starts rolling towards the giant drill. Kim jumps into her car and slams on the brake just in time. Back in HHM, Howard arrives in the underground parking lot to find Jimmy waiting for him. Jimmy tries telling Howard to settle Sandpiper and that the settlement sum is more than enough. Jimmy accuses HHM of screwing over the clients in order to keep the lawsuit going, but Howard laughs it off and knowing that Jimmy just wants his share of the payout. Howard compares Jimmy to Gollum, calling him transparent and pathetic. Howard belittles Jimmy by offering him some cash out of his wallet if he really wants a handout, telling Jimmy to bring a tin cup next time to be more honest. Jimmy insists again for Howard to settle and that it's in everyone's best interest. Howard just says that it's in Jimmy's best interest, accusing Jimmy of possibly even working up a scheme in order to force Sandpiper to settle if they don't do it themselves. Howard tells Jimmy that he doesn't think Jimmy will do it, as Jimmy will just be jeopardizing his payday. As Howard goes into the elevator, he tells Jimmy that you'll get your damn money. You just gonna have to wait for it. We then see Jimmy at the mall in a jogger outfit to mall walk. He does this so he can speak to Irene, who is also mall walking with all of her friends. Jimmy once again lies to Irene, saying he hasn't been able to mall walk for a while due to plantar fasciitis, which is essentially heel pain. Jimmy breaks about his new shoes, saying that they feel like he's walking on pillows. Jimmy explains that he bought a second pair for his girlfriend, but that they don't fit her, and that the store he bought them from has no refund policy. Jimmy asks what size Irene is, and then we cut to Jimmy looking in his trunk, full of the same pair of shoes, but in every different size imaginable. Jimmy gives Irene a pair that perfectly fits her and she loves them. She says that she can't take them for free, to which Jimmy says there is something that she can do for him. Jimmy tells Irene to not tell her other friends that he gave them to her, as he doesn't want them to think that he's playing favorites. As Irene walks away happily, Jimmy has a straight face on himself, knowing what he's about to do to her. Also, Jimmy lied about not having a refund policy at the store. Obviously, there is, considering he bought so many different sizes of the same shoe. Jimmy just lies every single step along the way to get what he wants, it's absolutely disgusting. And speaking about disgusting, we then get a montage of Jimmy trying to get Irene's friends to hate her. We first see Jimmy speaking to Irene's friends, telling them that if Irene settles, they'll get a bunch of money. On a different day, Jimmy continues to turn Irene's friends against her by stating that she may not want to settle because she doesn't need the money, saying that when someone starts buying nice things, they're walking on easy street. Irene's friends start believing Jimmy's manipulation tactics, with one of them even mentioning Irene's shoes as an example of something new Irene has bought. I assume Irene has mentioned her shoes to her friends, but of course they don't know that Jimmy gave them to her, as he specifically told her not to tell them. Jimmy completely set her up. Jimmy then convinces Irene's friends that if lawyers hold out on settling, they'll make a ton of extra money, while the Sandpiper elders only get a little bit more. Jimmy uses nuts to explain this, which is also a reference to when Saul explained money laundering to Jesse in Breaking Bad using nail salon items such as cotton balls, q-tips, and nail polish. Saul also tried explaining money laundering to Skylar in Breaking Bad with jelly beans and pencils for some reason, before she cut him off by saying she already knows what money laundering is. Anyways, as Jimmy convinces the elders that they won't get much more money by holding out on settling. He says that Irene knows this as the lawyers have explained it to her. This isn't true, since at the beginning of the episode, Irene told Jimmy that she doesn't understand any of it and leaves it to the lawyers to figure out. I, I don't know about all that, Jimmy. I, I just leave it all to the professionals. And Irene knows it too. I mean, the lawyers have explained it to her. Jimmy says that since Irene is the class representative, settling is technically all up to her. Jimmy then plays reverse psychology, saying that Irene probably knows what's best and that she's probably taking their feelings into account, which makes them think that she's not. We then cut to Irene mall walking by herself, calling out to her friends while they walk the other way, but they just ignore her and walk past her. This is straight up elder abuse and manipulation, and it genuinely does break my heart to see Jimmy turn Irene's friends against her. Meanwhile, Howard's secretary brings him a letter from Chuck, and Howard assumes that it's his letter of resignation. Howard opens the letter to find out that it's instead Chuck suing HHM for breach of contract. God damn it, Chuck. Howard goes to Chuck's house to confront him, and Chuck says that he's calling Howard's bluff. 
Chuck states that HHM is his and that it's successful because of him. Chuck says that Howard's father was in a two-room office when Chuck joined him and that Chuck trained Howard for the bar exam. Chuck tells Howard that if he doesn't trust his judgment, so be it, but that he'll have to pay him out of his share of $8 million. Howard says that Chuck would rather tear down HHM than retire, to which Chuck says, Do you think I'm trouble now? As your partner? Imagine me as your enemy. And I love this line. Again, Michael McKean does amazing acting here. Howard tries saying something here, but Chuck cuts him off, saying that they can speak in court. Chuck also has all the lights in his house turned on, and he's cooking on his stove with an electric blender to try and play up the fact that he's fully recovered. But as Howard leaves, Chuck reveals that he still feels symptoms of his condition, listing off the items he sees in front of him to make himself feel better, similar to when he went grocery shopping. Blue pot, red wine, black burner. Blue pot, red wine, black burner. Blue pot. Now, I really do think that this is a great scene between Chuck and Howard, and I love this arc between them during the end of Season 3, even though it is kinda horrible because of Jimmy throwing Chuck's insurance under the bus. Now, that night, Jimmy tampers with some bingo balls, using a syringe to inject a magnetic liquid inside of them. The next day, Jimmy hosts bingo once more, and we see Irene walk in, but none of her friends allow her to sit beside them. Some random elder wins bingo, and the crowd applauds. Big round of applause! Okay, new game, new cards! Jimmy gives Irene a specific bingo card and uses the rigged bingo balls to assure that Irene wins immediately. Right before Jimmy adds the rigged bingo balls into the mix, he takes a pause for a moment, thinking about what he's about to do. This is similar to when Jimmy took a pause earlier in the episode after giving Irene the pair of shoes, along with even Jimmy taking a pause right before he played the battery trick on Chuck in court. Jimmy knows what he's doing is incredibly wrong, but he rubs Marco's ring and does it anyways. When Irene wins and no one applauds for her and she runs out crying. Give it up for the big winner, Irene Landry! Fastest bingo of the night! Come on, let's hear it for Irene. Oh. Irene! This moment genuinely hurts my soul. Jimmy goes to confront Irene asking what's wrong, even though he already knows the answer. They've all turned on me. What? No! Yes. Irene says that all of her friends have turned against her, coldly ignoring her and talking behind her back. Irene says that she doesn't even know what she did wrong, to which Jimmy brings up the settlement, saying that they could be mad at her for not being considerate of their needs. Jimmy continues that maybe they need the money, to which Irene genuinely says she had no idea that they needed money, as none of them ever told her. Irene wishes that they never started this lawsuit, and she just wants things to go back to the way they were. I had no idea any of them needed money. No one said anything to me. Irene asks Jimmy what to do along with what he would do, but Jimmy says that he's not currently a lawyer, implying that he can't really give financial advice. Irene begs him, asking if she should settle, to which Jimmy pretends to think about it, telling her to follow her heart, indirectly implying and manipulating her into thinking that she should settle. Should I settle? Jimmy perfectly orchestrated Irene's friends to hate her due to her not settling, and then plants the idea of settling in her head to get his payout. This is incredibly cruel, and in my opinion, this is a new low for Jimmy. They're so cold. When I walk past them, they stop talking. And I, I, I hear them whispering when, when they think I'm not there. It's just so, it's so cruel, and I don't even know why. Irene's actor, Jean Effion, also does an amazing job in this episode, and I think her performance is criminally underrated. Also, sorry if I pronounced her name wrong. Kim is rushing to get her papers ready for the Gatwood drilling job, and Jimmy walks in with a bottle of Zephyr and Yeho. Look, I got Zephyro. Every time you see a bottle of Zephyr and Yeho on Better Call Saul or Breaking Bad, you know something horrible is about to happen. Jimmy says that he has big, life-changing news, but Kim just keeps working, saying she She's incredibly late already. Jimmy blurts out that Sandpiper is settling, and Kim is incredibly surprised. Don't get bogged down in the details! Trust me! They're settling! Jimmy tells Kim that they should celebrate being able to tell that she pulled another all-nighter. Jimmy's excited to get his cut of the common fund, as it solves all of his money problems that he's had ever since episode 306, or really ever since the beginning of the show, but Kim is too busy and needs to leave. You're not hearing me! Our troubles are over! Come on! Jimmy, I'm leaving now? As Kim leaves, Jimmy pressures Francesca into having a shot with him. We then get a long cut of Kim driving in her car, with a jarring cut of her suddenly crashing it. This was incredible shocking to see, and the editor did an amazing job using the same method of time skipping as they did earlier with Kim having her 5 minute power nap in the car.
they just completely cut out the part where Kim falls asleep and shows the last moment of her being awake, followed by the next moment when she wakes up. I just love this editing, it's so effective. Kim has overworked herself too much, and she's now paying the price for it. As Kim struggles to get out of her car, she's clearly very injured, having fallen asleep at the wheel and seeing that she drove her car off the road. The episode ends with a huge zoom out of the car crash with Kim's paperwork all over the ground. Wow, what an amazing way to end off the episode. Now on the cartel side of the show, Mike waits at Madrigal to speak to Lydia in regards to being hired by Madrigal, giving us her second chronological appearance on both Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad. Lydia explains Mike will be paid $10,000 each week, giving him his full $200,000 in 20 weeks. Lydia gives Mike HR paperwork along with asking for his license and social, but Mike is concerned about leaving a paper trail or being audited. Apparently only Lydia and Gus are aware of laundering his money, and that Madrigal goes through millions of dollars in operating costs in the US, with 114,000 employees worldwide. Lydia wants to hire him as a logistics consultant, but Mike prefers security consultant as he used to be a cop. Lydia says that this is the first time she's laundered money for anyone like this, and that Gus thinks highly of Mike. Funny thinking how Mike and Lydia's professional relationship starts in Better Call Saul compared to how it ends in Breaking Bad. Mike says Lydia is risking a lot for a drug dealer, to which Lydia mentions that if that's all Mike thinks that Gus is, then he doesn't truly know Gustavo Frank. We see a meeting between Gus and Hector with Victor, Arturo, and Nacho. They get a phone call notifying them that Eladio is so pleased with both Gus and Hector using the Los Pollos trucks for drug smuggling that he wants it to be permanent, stating how everything moves through the Chilean. Hector breaks the phone in anger, but Gus says that he never asked for this. Hector starts having heart problems and takes one of his pills to help. Little does Hector know that Nacho swapped his pills, creating a tense moment where we think that this is where Hector may go down. Hector survives this time, and it's known for people to survive episodes without having to take their medicine. Hector says, I like con Eladio, con bolsa y contigo. And he walks away. When Hector gets angry and his blood pressure rises, the heart has to pump harder to maintain that high blood pressure, and in that case, the supply can't meet the demand and it leads to chest pain. That's why he takes the medications, they dilate the vessels temporarily until the stressor is gone. Now, since Nacho swapped the pills with ibuprofen, the pain will be masked, but the heart muscle will still be receiving less oxygen. It won't instantly kill Hector, but it will weaken the muscle. And the point I'm trying to get across is that Hector might not have a stroke after his first episode, but after having Having more and more episodes, eventually he will have a stroke. So Hector won't die immediately. It'll take a few more instances of him having this sort of episode for Nacho to get the result he's looking for. Nacho goes to speak to his father to warn him that Hector wants to use his business to do illegal activity. Nacho tells his father that he has to go along with it for a few weeks and that it'll all blow over. If his father doesn't and instead goes to the cops, Nacho implies that Hector will have him killed. Nacho promises that it'll be over soon but doesn't say why as he doesn't want to tell his father that he's planning on killing Hector from swapping his heart pills. Nacho's father doesn't believe him, tells Nacho to get out of his house. I'm giving this episode an S tier. This episode was amazing, from the Howard vs Chuck confrontations to the Lydia cameo with Mike, and ending off with the jarring shock of Kim crashing her car. The scene where Irene runs out crying really gets to me. I remember actually tearing up the first time I watched it, and I still find this episode difficult to watch because of it. As I stated before, when a show makes me feel such heavy emotions, even when they're negative emotions, I really applaud it for it. I don't usually watch sad movies or whatever just to get sad, and I hate situations where like a show or a movie will just kill off a dog just because they know it'll make the viewers sad, but in situations like this, it really works and you can tell they put a lot of effort into it. It's not just a cheap tactic to make the viewers sad, it really genuinely pulls out your heartstrings. Whether I'm pissed off or sad, it just proves that the episode did an amazing job setting out what it intended to do, along with proving how invested I am due to the brilliant storytelling, directing, and acting. Now after watching this scene with Irene for the first and probably only time while doing these tier lists, I actually looked up what critics said about this episode, and I found a review saying that this episode felt like a slow motion car crash before accumulating into an actual inevitable wreck, and to be honest, I couldn't agree more. That's just a perfect summary for this episode. Season 3, Episode 10. This episode starts with a flashback to Jimmy and Chuck as children in a tent in their backyard as Chuck reads The Adventures of Mabel to Jimmy, giving a payoff from the first episode of the season. As Chuck reads the book, he speaks about a wolf, giving a howl similar to the howls that Jimmy would always do with Slip and Jimmy when indicating to Marco that he was on his way with their next con target. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. 
This is also a subtle nod to the wolves and sheep flashback. As the camera zooms into their tent, it continues to zoom into the lantern that they're using, which is also foreshadowing to the end of the episode, with this being the same type of lantern that Chuck has used in his house throughout the entirety of the show. But back in the current timeline, we cut to Kim in the hospital, with Jimmy walking in to greet her as she gets a cast put on her arm. We then jump to Chuck at HHM with lawsuit papers in front of him, as Howard and the rest of HHM's board just stares at him thinking, what the heck? Chuck explains that lawsuits, threats, and recriminations are a situation that no firm wants to be in as they are embarrassing. Chuck lists off their options. First, taking it to trial would be expensive and damaging to HHM's reputation, or second, that HHM could buy him out, but that would bankrupt them. He says he spent decades building the firm and that he doesn't want to be the reason for its destruction, so he offers a third option, that they let bygones be bygones and put all this behind them. When Chuck offers Howard a handshake, Howard asks for them to have the room, which is never a good sign. Can I have the room? Everybody, please, just give us a few. Would you all give us the room for a moment? Once everyone leaves, Howard starts saying that they've been working together for almost 18 years. Howard says that in all that time, he's looked up to Chuck and supported him because Howard thought he always had the firm's best interest in mind. Chuck agrees saying that he has, but Howard corrects him saying that he did. Howard calls Chuck out for letting personal vendettas get in the way of what's best for HHM, and that Chuck has put his needs first to HHM's detriment. Chuck disagrees, but Howard continues that- And the moment that I mildly suggest, with empathy and concern, that maybe it's time for you to consider retirement. The first instinct you have is to sue me? To sue the firm. Howard then asks Chuck that in what world is that anything but the deepest betrayal of their friendship, along with everything they've worked so hard to accomplish. Chuck tries arguing that Howard is the one who betrayed him, but Howard calls BS. I, I don't even know. In what world is that anything but the deepest betrayal of everything we worked so hard to accomplish? In what world is that anything but the deepest betrayal of our friendship? Howard, I could argue that you're the one who betrayed me. That's bullshit, and you know it saying that this is pointless to argue as Chuck won't listen to reason. Howard hands Chuck a check for $3 million, the first of three payments. Chuck is confused, saying that the firm couldn't afford this, asking Howard if he's shutting down. Howard says that he would never endanger the firm, and that he's paying Chuck out of his pocket, along with taking out a few loans. Howard tells Chuck that he won, and he walks away. In my opinion, everything Howard just told Chuck is correct, but Chuck is too high and mighty to acknowledge it. Howard knows that Chuck was blackmailing HHM with a lawsuit, so Howard subverts that by paying Chuck out of his own pocket, keeping the firm safe and negating Chuck's blackmail. You're paying me out of your own pocket. You won. Howard says that Chuck won the fight when, in reality, he lost the battle. Last episode, Chuck called Howard's bluff, but here, Howard calls Chuck's bluff. Chuck thought that threatening to sue HHM would give Howard no choice but to give Chuck what he wanted, but he never expected Howard to pay out of pocket. This way, Chuck isn't damaging HHM, only Howard himself, which I believe Chuck does feel bad for afterwards. Three million dollars. The first of three payments, as per the partnership agreement. The firm can't afford this. Are you? You're not shutting down, are you? I would never endanger the firm. This is mostly for my personal funds and a few loans. Chuck has betrayed Howard and ruined their friendship along with losing his job. Also, all the board members knew that Howard was going to pay out of pocket, giving a greater significance for the way that they stared at Chuck during the beginning of the scene, as they already knew the end result before Chuck did. This is pointless. Here, just take this. As Chuck and Howard exit the meeting room, every single employee at HHM is outside the main entrance waiting for him to give him a grand exit with a round of applause. Howard tells everyone that Chuck is leaving HHM and that he wants everyone to give Chuck a round of applause to thank him for everything he's done for HHM. Howard says that HHM started out with six employees and that Chuck helped grow the firm to one of the largest in the state. Howard asks Chuck if he has anything he wants to say, but Chuck just gives Howard the biggest death glare I think I've ever seen. As Chuck walks down the stairs, everyone gives Chuck a constant round of applause to the point that it feels almost uncomfortable. Chuck walks through the doors to leave HHM, never to return again. Howard stops clapping, his smile turns into a frown, and he walks away as well. Back at home, Kim is uncomfortably resting in bed due to her new cast. Jimmy starts acting like her stay-at-home nurse, but she gets up on her own to join him for breakfast. Jimmy starts talking about shutting down their office, and Kim is surprised. Jimmy admits that he doesn't care about the office and that he's just happy she's okay. Kim admits that she only got six hours of sleep throughout the entire previous week, and that she fell asleep at the wheel, crossing three lanes of traffic, and she doesn't even remember it. Kim almost dying is a wake-up call for Jimmy, and so he says that he wants to fix things, implying his relationship with Chuck. Francesca then brings Kim flowers from Kevin and Paige, along with gifts from Gatwood Drilling as well. Francesca tells her, You are so lucky. I used to drive that highway every weekend to visit my brother and his kids, and I saw an accident almost every single time. People die on that road all the time. I know the feeling when something you 
you think in your head sounds better than when you say it out loud, but jeez Francesca, how could you not realize that that's the most horrible thing you could say to her? Francesca then tells Kim that the Gatwood meeting was pushed forward and she'll still be able to potentially finish it before the deadline, but as Kim starts working on it, she changes her mind. She tells Francesca to cancel Gatwood and push everything else, as falling asleep at the wheel was really a wake-up call. So, in a way, the horrible pep talk that Francesca gave her was helpful, but in the opposite way as she originally intended. Kim instead gets Francesca to drive them to Blockbuster, which is quite a flash from the past. Better Call Saul is such a low-key, early 2000s period piece, and I love that about this show. Francesca calls Gatwood to transfer to Schweikart and Coakley as Kim picks out movies. Meanwhile, Jimmy goes to Chuck's house and parks outside. Jimmy's about to second-guess himself and just drive off, but he stops himself and decides to go see Chuck after all. Jimmy bangs on the door, saying that he knows that Chuck won't want to see him, but he just wants to know Chuck is okay. Chuck answers just to try and slam the door shut again, but Jimmy stops him, asking to come in and talk for a minute. As Jimmy walks in, he's surprised to see that all of Chuck's electronics are plugged in and on, even with music playing. As Jimmy looks around, Chuck stands ominously in the living room waiting for him, saying that he's more than alright. Chuck says he told Jimmy that he'd always get better, and that Jimmy just never believed him. This is a very childish way of, like, rubbing in someone's face saying, Hi, I told you so. Now Jimmy's happy to see that Chuck's better and asks how, but Chuck just dodges that question, asking Jimmy what he wants. I just need to know you're alright. As you can see, I'm more than alright. I'm very well, in fact. What was it you wanted? beyond proof of life. Jimmy says something happened, which made him think what happened between them. This once again implies that since Kim almost died, Jimmy realized how important the people that he cares about in his life are since they could be gone in an instant. Jimmy adds that he doesn't blame himself entirely for what happened between himself and Chuck, but that he could have made different choices and that if he had to do it all over again, he would do it differently. Chuck asks Jimmy if he has regrets and when Jimmy says yes, Chuck asks why. You're just gonna keep hurting people. That's not true. Jimmy, this is what you do. You hurt people over and over and over, and then there's this show of remorse. Jimmy says that Chuck is his brother, and since they're the only two McGills still alive, that they should stick together. Chuck clarifies how that's not what he meant, asking Jimmy what's the point of having regrets at all. Why have regrets at all? What's the point? What do you mean? Well, look at you. You're in so much pain. Why are you putting yourself through all this? Chuck says that Jimmy's in so much pain and that he shouldn't bother putting himself through all of that. Because I wanted to tell you that you have regrets. And I'm telling you, don't bother. What's the point? Chuck says that Jimmy's going to keep hurting people as that's what he always does. You have to make a change before it's too late. Before you destroy yourself or someone else. In the end, you're going to hurt everyone around you. You can't help it. Chuck knows that Jimmy's emotions are real, but adds that he's not going to change. Jimmy hurts people and then shows remorse, with Chuck adding that he should just skip even having remorse. And when you think about future seasons, Jimmy really takes this advice to heart, but I'll save that discussion for another tier list. Jimmy says that he can change, but Chuck disagrees. And I believe you can change. He'll never change. He'll never change ever since he was nine. Always the same. If you're not going to change your behavior, and you won't. This is where we get the iconic line of Chuck saying that in the end, Jimmy will hurt everyone around him, and that he can't help it, so he should just stop apologizing and embrace it, as Chuck would have more respect for him if he did. Jimmy flips it back on Chuck, asking him if he thinks he's done anything wrong, or if he's just an innocent victim. Chuck redirects the conversation by saying things are fine the way they are. You don't have to make up with me. We don't have to understand each other. Things are fine the way they are. Implying that Jimmy and Chuck don't need to mend their relationship and that it's okay being estranged due to Chuck admitting that he never really cared much about Jimmy. Hey. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but the truth is you've never mattered all that much to me. We all know that this isn't true, because if Chuck never cared, he wouldn't have had such a lifelong vendetta against Jimmy. Chuck says that he doesn't want to hurt Jimmy's feelings, but that's exactly what he's trying to do here, and it works. Chuck goes to sit down at his desk, with Jimmy just standing there, eventually walking away. Jimmy takes one last look at Chuck, and leaves without saying another word. This entire scene is iconic. This is one of my favorite scenes out of the entire show, along with my favorite moment between Chuck and Jimmy. So stop apologizing and accept it. Embrace it. Frankly, I have more respect for you if you did. This is three seasons worth of story all crashing down around you, concluding their story arc together in a way that pushes Jimmy in the direction that he goes in for the rest of Better Call Saul along with even Breaking Bad. When this episode originally aired along with in future seasons, I've always come back to this conversation to use as an example in my videos. It's not a show. I know you don't think it's a show. I don't doubt your emotions are real. But what's the point of all the sad faces and the gnashing of teeth? 
I can Why not just skip the whole exercise? I've done many breakdowns for this scene in the past, and once the show's over, I can see myself doing many more breakdowns in the future in regards to the Chuck versus Jimmy dynamic, Chuck's condition, along with how Jimmy turned into Saul. This is one of the most important scenes in the entire show. So much can be discussed from it, even with just a single line of dialogue. Now, later that night, when Chuck is in bed, he starts feeling symptoms of his condition, as he once again recites the items he sees in front of him to help him cope, along with writing in his journal the symptoms that he's currently having. Chuck goes downstairs and flips off all the breakers, implying that he's starting to relapse. The next day, Chuck goes outside to see that the power meter is still turning, thinking that there's something wired in the house that's still creating a current due to not being connected to the breaker box. Chuck calls an electric company to come over and fix the problem, but they tell him it'll take a few days, causing Chuck to do it himself. The score that plays in the background is brilliant as Chuck slowly starts losing his mind. I love Dave Porter, he always does a great job. Chuck calls Dr. Cruz's office to cancel his appointment, saying he doesn't need to reschedule and that he'll just see her next week. Something tells me that won't be happening. Chuck continues to frantically search his house for any sort of current, shutting off and unplugging anything that he can, along with even breaking down his walls to try and find wires. Chuck continuously checks his power meter while breaking his house down, clearly going completely crazy. Chuck eventually even smashes his power meter with a baseball bat. Watching Chuck's mental health deteriorate while he breaks down his house is just incredibly powerful and symbolic, especially since at the beginning of the season he showed so much care about his house while Jimmy was taking the tape off the wall. You're pulling the varnish right off the walnut. <laughs> Pull any varnish off the walnut. Most certainly you are. Look, look, see? Meanwhile, Jimmy arrives at Irene's, bringing treats and balloons to quote-unquote celebrate winning. Irene tells Jimmy that her friends still hate her, causing Jimmy to go speak to them at the mall to try and be friends with Irene again. They tell Jimmy that things just aren't the same since they think that Irene showed her true colors. Jimmy says that he stuck his nose where it didn't belong and that he stirred the pot. Jimmy tells them to blame him, but they just love him too much. Later that night, Jimmy then realizes that the only way to fix things with Irene is to tear himself down, saying that he doesn't want to do it as it'll cause Sandpiper not to settle. The next day, Jimmy sets himself up at Sandpiper so that when he walks off to speak to Aaron, he still has his microphone turned on while purposely outing himself, manipulating Irene and her friends, making himself sound like a horrible person so that Irene's friends will hate him and accept Irene back into their friend group. Jimmy walks back in and pretends to just realize that his mic was still on, with Irene and her friends staring at him, walking off together. Afterwards, Jimmy speaks to Aaron, showing that this was all planned. Jimmy tells Aaron that Irene should sign back up for the settlement plan and thanks her even after she tells him that she meant every word she said during the scheme in regards to calling him a disgusting person. Jimmy did this because Chuck told him that all he does is ruin the lives of everyone around him and that he should just embrace it and stop feeling bad for it. Jimmy wanted to prove Chuck wrong, along with proving to himself that this wasn't true, undoing everything he did with Irene and her friends in order to fix their friendship even at the cost of Sandpiper not settling anymore. Jimmy and Kim pack up their season 3 office since Jimmy has finally accepted closing down the office. They also say their farewell Wells to Francesca, who's clearly more affectionate towards Kim than she is to Jimmy. Francesca says that she was able to get her previous job back, with Jimmy apologizing that things didn't work out, saying, And you know, if we ever get another office up, he'd be our first call. Yeah. Okay. Francesca doesn't sound all too flattered by this notion, but we all know that although this is the last time Francesca works for Jimmy, Saul Goodman is a whole other story. Jimmy throws out his elder appointment book since Irene and her friends are ruining his good reputation in elder law, with Jimmy telling Kim that he'll need a whole new business model when he does get his law license back, and oh boy does he ever. Jimmy takes one last look at his office and Kim tells him that they'll get another one in the future. They walk out the door for a final time while showing a shot of the empty office afterwards, which is such a cliche but they used it well here. Cutting back to Chuck at his house, everything potentially electronic is thrown out in the yard. We look around his house to see it completely destroyed, with Chuck sitting down and curled up in a space blanket. Chuck repeatedly kicks a table with his lantern on it until it falls, setting his house on fire as the camera cuts to an outside shot of his house, seeing the flames through the windows. This is how the episode ends, and how the season ends. This is how Chuck's character ends as well. The end of season 3 includes the first major character death on the show. This is an amazing amazingly tragic way to conclude Chuck's character, and I love it while at the same time hating that we'll never see Chuck in the show again, well, at least alive in the current timeline. That being said, this really does fit. This gives a bookend on the first three seasons of the show, making it feel like it's truly its own separate era, the Chuck era. During my first viewing of the show, I was fully on board with the hashtag FChuck bandwagon, but every time I rewatch the first three seasons, I grow more and more appreciation for Chuck's character, along with just the brilliant job that Michael McKee 
Keen did portraying him. In this episode and this season in general, Chuck has lost everything he's ever cared about. He feels like he's ruined his already estranged relationship with Rebecca and couldn't even look at her the final time that she tried to see him. Chuck tried pushing Jimmy away from him just to hurt him, implying to Jimmy that he never wants their brotherly relationship to recover from what's happened. Chuck has also ruined his own reputation, along with HHM's reputation. He also caused Howard to force him out of the firm, losing his job and his closest friendship. Chuck dedicated his life to his work, and now he has nothing to show for it. Well, he does have millions of dollars, Chuck does die a millionaire, but you know, the cliche money doesn't buy you happiness. In reality, although what Chuck said to Jimmy during their final scene was mostly true in regards to Jimmy hurting everyone around him, in the end, Chuck also hurt all the people around him too, and in some ways was potentially projecting himself onto Jimmy. Now, on the cartel side of the show, Hector arrives at Nacho's father's business, and Nacho tries showing Hector around, trying to avoid Hector actually talking to his father, but Hector just wants to speak to Poppy. I love the way that Hector says, Where's the uh, Poppy? Here. Here's Poppy. To the point, I've used that clip in more videos than I can count. Hector greets Papa with a smile, but Papa looks very upset. Hector brings out a large wad of cash and starts counting hundreds on the counter, but Papa just keeps giving Hector a blank stare. Papa finally tells Hector to please get out of his store, which, wow, how naive can you be? I get being a straight up guy, but... Come on, man. I understand that it sucks that Nacho has unintentionally put his father in this situation and that Nacho's father is incredibly mad about it, and it isn't fair to Papa. Like, this does really suck, but once you're already in this situation, you're really gonna act like that knowing the ramifications that could happen? Nacho says Don Hector's being very generous and to not be disrespectful while staring at his father to take the cash. At this point, Hector looks very displeased, as Nacho reminds his father the obvious about the rest of their family and what could happen to them if he doesn't take the cash. Papa finally reluctantly takes the cash, and Hector instantly walks out. Nacho follows, telling Hector that Papa will come around, but Hector just says that he doesn't trust him as he gets into his car. We all know what that means, leaving Papa in serious trouble. Later that night, Nacho follows Hector to try and aim a shot at him with his gun, but doesn't get the chance as more people arrive. Arturo tells Nacho that he got his message, and Nacho says yes, but it's implied that this is a lie as Nacho was just about to try and kill Hector. Nacho and Arturo then meet with Hector, Bolsa, and Gus. Bolsa tells Hector that Don Eladio wanted them to speak face to face so there were no misunderstandings due to Hector breaking his phone in the last episode. Bolsa tells Hector that all of their product will be smuggled across the border through Gus's Los Pollos trucks due to efficiency. Bolsa says that this decision is final, but he means no disrespect to the Salamancas. Hector asks why Gus is even there, to which Bolsa says that they have to settle their feud and that the boss wants them to cooperate. Hector says, The boss can suck me which has become a hilarious meme as fans change the interpretation of what Hector says to Boss can suck me. So Hector becomes enraged at Bolsa, saying how the Salamancas built the whole business. Bolsa tells Hector to calm down, but Hector keeps going off yelling that You should be kissing my ass right now! Salamanca money! Salamanca blood! Little did Hector know that that would be the last thing he'd ever say, as he has a stroke mid-sentence and collapses due to his heart pills being swapped by Nacho, so they obviously don't work. As Hector collapses, he throws the pill bottle at Nacho unintentionally, but all the pills spill out. Gus jumps into action, giving Hector CPR while yelling to call 911 and telling Bolsa to leave before the ambulance arrives. While Gus tries to resuscitate Hector, Nacho casually picks up Hector's pills so that he can swap them back. We then cut to Hector being wheeled into the ambulance, and as Nacho gives the paramedics Hector's heart pills, Gus glances at Nacho doing so, implying that he's onto what Nacho just did. This episode gets a very strong S tier. There's only one or two forgettable scenes, such as Kim going to Blockbuster, but for the most part, everything is top tier. Chuck and Howard confronting each other, resulting in Chuck Chuck leaving HHM, Chuck and Jimmy confronting each other one final time, along with Chuck's relapse and downfall. This was a perfectly tragic send-off to Chuck's character, and I really do love it. Not only that, but everything that happens between Nacho and Hector perfectly concludes the entire Nacho arc this season, showing how Nacho was the one to put Hector in a wheelchair. Plus, the fact that it's hinted how Gus is onto Nacho also sets up the story arc between them for the next season, along with the rest of the show in general. This is possibly my favorite season finale of the show ever, but 
Granted, I haven't seen Season 6 Part 2, as at the time of recording this video, the final half of the final season hasn't released yet, but this episode is extremely underrated when the topic comes up as to what best episodes of the show are. This is definitely one of my favorite episodes of the show. So this season, I gave the episodes 4 S tiers, 4 A tiers, only 1 B tier, and our first ever double S tier. Have y'all caught on that I love this season yet? In all seriousness, Season 3 was my favorite season for a very long time, and even after Season 3, but we'll discuss that in future tier lists. So, do any other episodes from season 1 or 2 deserve to be bumped up to double S tier? The only episode I'm going to bump up from single S tier to double S tier is the episode 10650. So here's all three updated tier lists separately but side by side, and then here's all the season 1 to 3 episodes combined into one big tier list. With season 3 complete, we'll be ranking season 4 next, and oh boy, that'll be interesting. Also, check out the companion video I'll be doing alongside this review where I discuss Jimmy messing around with Chuck's insurance from episode 307, along with the new confirmation that it was in the moment and not pre-planned. I'll have that video linked at the end of this video along with in the description once that video is uploaded. I'd appreciate a like on the video if you've enjoyed anything I've said today, and if you're new to the channel or just having it already, subscribe and hit that bell notification to stay updated on when I post new content on Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad. Check out my Patreon or give a super thanks to help support the channel financially. This video took a really long time to make. If you got a few spare bucks lying around, it'd mean a lot, and also thanks for those who have already. But most importantly, I thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out. Oh no, but wait, I forgot to talk about the Kettleman bonus scene. <laughs>